Are you ready, kids? Hey guys, Pie Rules here, and welcome to every episode of SpongeBob Season 9 Reviewed. Season 9 is interesting for a lot of reasons. Firstly, it took so long to air. To put it into perspective, Season 9 was the current season when I started doing these reviews. It started airing in 2012 and didn't finish airing until 2017. The main reason for this seems to be the second Spongebob movie. Because they basically halted production, Nickelodeon only had the episodes in 9A to air, so they decided to to hold them and stretch it out over long periods of time so that we wouldn't be completely without Spongebob. What is Season 9A? Well, it's a fan term for the first 20 episodes of Spongebob Season 9. These 20 episodes were aired and made before the second Spongebob movie came out, whereas the rest of Season 9 was aired after the movie and presumed to have been finished after the movie was finished. With the minor exception of Yeti Crabs, which aired after the second movie, but we know was made before it. And that would make 9B the last 29 episodes of season 9. Fans like to split this up because, Yeti Crabs excluded, there was a pretty long gap between 9A and 9B. Some fans also think that 9B is really good compared to 9A, which they consider just average. That's not necessarily my opinion, I'm just explaining that that's why a lot of people like to split it up. And as much as it is frustrating for fans to have to go so long between them, I will give Nick credit for making sure there was at least one new episode every year. The other thing I wanted to mention before getting into the reviews is the fact that the show changed from standard definition to widescreen HD. This was not the first time Spongebob was ever in HD though. There were two episodes, Truth or Square and It's a Spongebob Christmas, from previous seasons that were broadcast in HD. But this is the first entire season to be in HD. Of course, I I will talk about this in detail as it comes up, but I want to give an overview of this now because this is a huge format change for the show. Sure, Spongebob went from more traditional inking in season one to the digital stuff we all know and love now in season two and has gone through a few slight art evolutions over the seasons, but none have ever been as drastic as this big switch to HD. And it's something you notice right away when watching the season. SpongeBob took its sweet time transitioning into high definition, and I can't blame the people behind the show. The thing is, when you switch to HD, you have to change certain things. For instance, they had to redo the bubble transition because obviously it just wouldn't fit the screen. Another thing that they had to redo was the theme song, although it took them a while on that. The episodes aired in 9A did not have the HD theme song, on initial airing. And in fact, if you bought the episodes on Amazon Instant Video and I assume other places, they will also have the old style opening. My point is, it's not as simple to just say, all right, well, now we're going to do this in a little bit higher definition. Certain things had to change and be redone, which is a pretty big deal for a show like SpongeBob that intentionally tries to change as little as possible in the almost 18 years it's been on air. I'll talk about the new opening later on in the video when we get to 9B but there are some changes that I want to talk about here. Like I mentioned, the bubble transition looks different, and I have to say that I really like it. It looks really clear and nice. Another noticeable change is that places like the Krusty Krab or SpongeBob's house just have a much bigger feel to them because more of them can fit in the frame at any given time. And although it takes a little bit of getting used to, it does look really good. And since they switched to HD, I've noticed they've done quite a few wide shots, shots from far away that show a lot of the background and have the characters be relatively small. You notice it right away in the first episode of the season, which has to do with extreme sports. Now that the definition is higher and they have more screen space, there's just a lot more area to work with. And this is especially noticeable in scenes with Plankton. Now more than ever, they can do a great job of showing how much smaller he is than the other characters. Overall, I am very happy with what they have done with this new format change. One more thing I have to mention before I get to my usual spiel, is that whenever there is a big change to a show, either visually or something behind the scenes like the creator coming back, there are going to be people who automatically claim that the show is better or good again. It's easy to be suckered in by new episodes after a long time without and a shiny new HD style and artificially bump up ratings of these episodes without giving them the same treatment as all the rest. While yes, the HD is nice, it's important to realize that this is a thing that can 
happen and not to let your actual judgment get swept away in hype. There are a lot of people out there that think season 9 is the second coming of Spongebob. And while I'm sure some people have judged it fairly and do genuinely believe that, it's likely that some aren't judging these episodes fairly. Which is fine if you're just a casual viewer, but if you want to look at things critically, you do have to give every episode a fair and equal shot. And now my usual spiel before we begin. First of all, I have a series called Spongy Bits, which is a singular review or a series of reviews of Spongebob episodes that I've already covered in season reviews, but I go into a bit more depth there. If you like these videos, you'll probably like those videos, so check them out. Secondly, I have a series of videos called Square Theory, wherein I talk about various topics related to Spongebob. If you hear me saying something repeatedly in these videos, then odds are I've probably made a Square Theory about it. If you want to hear more on topics like what makes a Squidward torture episode bad, or why Patrick is such a jerk, then please check out this series of videos. Also, I will be spoiling everything in these episodes, so if you haven't seen some of these season 9 episodes, then you might not want to watch this video yet. Before making this video, the only episodes of season 9 I'd seen were Kenny the Cat and Little Yellow Book, and I'd seen both of those around the time they were both aired, meaning it's been a long time. And with all that out of the way, let's start off with the first episode of my long-awaited review of Spongebob season 9. Episode 179A, Extreme Spots. SpongeBob and Patrick try to prove they are extreme to an extreme sports group. First of all, this episode is a really great way to show off the new animation. There is a lot of action going on here, a lot of different camera angles, a lot of wide shots, a lot of explosions, just a lot going on, and it does a really good job of showing off what they can do now. If nothing else, it's a very good looking episode. Additionally, I like the new characters they got. Johnny Knoxville does a great job as Johnny Krill, and the other two characters are so outrageously extreme they just stick in your head. Not Dead Ted, the crazy one, and Grand Mall Granny, as the elderly person who also participates in extreme sports. So the visuals and the characters are good, but that's about where the good things end. Unfortunately, there isn't really much of a story here. It's one of those episodes that's just about Spongebob and Patrick trying to prove that they aren't little babies. And that's as far as the story goes. There's not really any ups or downs or twists or turns, it's just Spongebob and Patrick trying to prove they're tough to these extreme sports stars. And that would be fine if the episode was funny, but the humor here is, well, it's mixed. There are jokes that I like, like the fact that there's just this inexplicably placed random accent guy, and the names of the extreme sports characters are pretty funny too, but at the same time, there's some humor in this that I find quite dumb. The whole pillow and mattress coming to life and swearing vengeance, yeah, that just felt really out of place to me. Similarly, Patrick licking his brain like an ice cream cone did nothing for me. I will give them credit that they are trying and that there is a number of gags in the episode, but I didn't find that many of them to be funny. Especially the joke that makes the title of the episode. While I like the guy with the weird accent, the whole running thing about Patrick thinking that they need spots to be extreme sports stars and he stings himself with jellyfish and they say, hey, we have extreme spots now. It's a lame pun to begin with, but they just keep going on and on with the gag. Yeah, I thought that was pretty dumb. And the other problem with this episode Episode is that we've had episodes about extreme sports before, pre-hibernation week and a life in a day. This plot is actually very similar to a life in a day. Spongebob and Patrick trying to prove that they're tough enough to do these extreme stunts. I'm not saying the show could never do another episode about extreme sports, but the fact that there is very little story here and it's a concept that they've done not once but twice before just makes it feel very bland. And if they're going to cover a topic they've already covered before, I'd at least like them to take it in a new direction. Or or heck, just be really funny about it. But, because it's similar to other stories the show has already done before, as well as the relative blandness of the story, along with the mixed quality humor, but really nice looking visuals, and entertaining and memorable new characters, I say that this rounds out to about a Meh. But unfortunately, it takes a little more than just pretty visuals and some fun new characters for me to give it a good. Thanks to the very simple story, the episode feels like it drags, and when I think back to it, although I can remember the characters and the nice visuals, I can't really remember anything else about the episode. Episode 179B, Squirrel Record. Sandy attempts to break every record in the book, with no regard for Spongebob's safety. So this episode brought back Sandy's robot army from the episode House Sittin' for Sandy. It's always interesting to see what else 
elements on SpongeBob actually make return appearances. As most characters, hobbies, and other elements added to the show are usually just one-offs, with the rare exception. I for one welcome the idea of Sandy having a robot army. Think of the stories they could tell. Maybe Karen would leave Plankton and run away with one of them. Maybe they could malfunction and try to take over Bikini Bottom. Maybe they throw a never-ending stream of pies at Patrick's face. The possibilities are endless. Anyway, back to the actual focus of the episode. Story-wise, this is very similar to Pre-Hibernation Week. So yeah, that'd be two for two episodes thus far that remind me of Pre-Hibernation Week. But it's true, Sandy wants to do something with Spongebob, but that something continuously gets Spongebob hurt until Spongebob has to do something about it. And like the episode previous, that's about the entirety of the story. It's basically just an extended montage of Sandy breaking records and Spongebob getting hurt along the way. And while Sandy does break these records in very unusual ways, the episode kind of feels a little bit boring because, much like the previous one, it just doesn't really go anywhere. Sandy succeeds at everything she does. So, outside of the one record that she looks like she might actually fail, the chum one, there's never any suspense or surprise. Well, okay, there's a surprise at the end, where it turns out that everything Sandy did was completely pointless. I wonder how many times Spongebob has done this, had an episode where the ending proves that the events in the episode were utterly, utterly pointless. In this case, it's fine, it's just a silly comedy ending, but still, it's kind of interesting to think about how Spongebob has done this a number of times. Anyway, my point is, while it's kind of fun to watch Sandy break these records, it's just not all that interesting. One of the more intriguing parts of the story is that, at the very beginning, Spongebob takes a Krabby Patty and puts it in his wallet for later, and then around the middle of the episode, he takes it out to resuscitate Sandy after she passes out from eating a bunch of chum. While it was cool that they set up something very early in the episode that paid off a little bit later, it is a bit weird that this wasn't at the climax of the episode. It just happens about midway in. In fact, the chum record was probably the most interesting one. Plankton got a cameo, and it was the one record she looked like she might not actually break, and did genuinely need Spongebob's help for. I just kinda wish that the whole episode could have been like that. Add in some suspense, give Spongebob a real reason to be there. As it stands, this is another episode that I think is meh. It's just kind of boring. And though Sandy's actions are amusing, I wouldn't say that anything in the episode is particularly funny. It's just a pretty middle-of-the-road episode. Though I have to say, I really do enjoy what they did with the name of the record book. How it's a mixture of the Guinness Book of World Records and Ripley's Believe It or Not. Episode 180A, Patrick Man. Patrick decides to become a superhero. In what is the closest thing to this season's version of a Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy episode. Yes, this is Ernest Boardnine's last appearance as Mermaid Man, and as such, there is no actual Mermaid Man episode this season. But, it is pretty poetic that his last line on the show ever was, EVIL! So this episode has Patrick donning superhero attire, running around, reprimanding people for crimes that Patrick believes they've committed, even though of course they're all just innocent people doing normal things. This is not a new concept for Spongebob. They've done this before in shuffleboarding and way back in season one's Hall Monitor. In this type of story, you're either gonna find Patrick's antics to be really funny or really stupid. Personally, I don't find Patrick's behavior to be funny here and just strike strikes me as annoyingly stupid. And that, combined with the fact that they've done this story before, is not a good combo. However, I do like the climax of this episode. Once an actual supervillain arrives, and Patrick tries to save the day but fails miserably at first, that part I think is actually pretty funny. There were good gags, it was action-packed, and it made for a pretty exciting climax. But I don't think that saves this episode from being a scumbob episode. As cool as the climax is, it's only about two minutes of the episode, and the rest of it is just kind of dumb. Patrick's actions here are obnoxious, instead of being funny and charming like Spongebob's were way back in Hall Monitor. Also, this episode's beginning is weirdly similar to No Hat for Pat, with Patrick talking about Spongebob's hat and how he gets to go have a fun job, which really just makes me wish I was watching that episode. Episode 180B, 
Gary's new toy. Gary becomes obsessed with a red ball. Oh boy, a Gary episode. Well, if you watched my reviews previously, you probably know that this isn't gonna get a good. And sure enough, it suffers from some of the problems that other Gary episodes have. The biggest problem being just that this feels like every other Gary episode. There's an element of miscommunication with Gary not being able to understand SpongeBob's goodbye. Gary obsesses over something just like he did in Treats. Gary leaves SpongeBob for another character. Character, like in Dumped. SpongeBob tries to get Gary to do something, like in Gary Takes a Bath. Also, Gary only interacts with Spongebob in the episode. And because Gary can't talk, certain elements of the story are left to be a bit vague. Like, what exactly is this ball? Does it actually have powers? Is it evil? Is it trying to control Gary? Or is this all just made up in his imagination? But, to its credit, the episode isn't annoying and it doesn't really have many bad elements. It's just really samey. And a little too vague on certain points. As far as the humor goes, it's... All right. Patrick's brain getting shot out by the laser was definitely more gross and weird than funny. But I thought it was funny how SpongeBob called Gary creepy for making himself look like the ball, as well as how Gary gets rid of SpongeBob by slapping his eye against the garage door opener. And SpongeBob's eyes getting knocked out of his head was a decent gag as well. Another thing I thought was pretty funny was Plankton's random ad on the bench. It has really nothing to do with anything, but just the way that Plankton is lying down and how just out of left field the bench is, is actually pretty funny. Also, his phone number is apparently 1-800-EAT-CHUM. The episode is about a meh. It's pretty easy to watch, but it's not something I got much enjoyment out of. Maybe someday they can finally break away from having Gary plots that are incredibly similar to previous Gary plots. But unfortunately, this is not that day. Episode 181A, License to Milkshake. SpongeBob must go back to basic training camp to renew his milkshake license. So, if you didn't know, this episode is a big reference to Top Gun. I've never actually seen Top Gun, but that still was pretty apparent to me. And the episode does work as a story on its own in-universe. We aren't talking about one of these parodies where the characters are suddenly just completely out of character for the sake of the parody. And for what it's worth, I think the best part of the episode is the 80s montage, which is a very direct reference to Top Gun. It's fun, upbeat, and fast-paced. Another nice thing about the episode was the climax at the end. I liked that they gave Captain Frosty Mug a weird backstory and how the show suddenly turned up the drama. But on the flip side of things, the entire story was about SpongeBob trying to get a license. And while yes, it is very different than a typical boating school episode in a lot of ways, it is still kind of sad that they still had to resort to a similar plot device. Though SpongeBob does at least reference at the end that he wishes boating school licenses were as easy to obtain as the milkshake one. Michael McKean plays Captain Frosty Frosty Mug, and his character is okay. I wouldn't say he's a very memorable character, but he's not a bad one either. At first, I thought he was going to be a nasty drill sergeant like we've already seen twice on the show, but luckily they took it in a little bit different direction. One thing I didn't like about this story was that it never explains why SpongeBob's milkshakes always come out solid. It would have been nice at the end if there was some sort of reveal where it turned out he was putting too much ice in the shakes, or he was using too much syrup, or something else, maybe even something weird and comedic just to explain why he has this specific problem. Yes, they do have the whole milkshakes come from within line, but still, it would have been nice to have an actual reason for SpongeBob's shakes turning out this way. And also, I don't really understand the point of a milkshake license. Like, okay, it's silly to begin with, but SpongeBob serves the guy a milkshake at the end of the episode before he gets his license back. So, is he still allowed to serve milkshakes without the license? Is it just a prestige thing? Is it like a system of honor where only the best restaurants have licenses? milkshake people, but everyone else can still serve milkshakes? I know I'm thinking way too much about this, but I think it's a result of this being another story that's really just bare bones. I know it's Spongebob, so I'm not expecting too much, but I would have liked the story to at least have gone into a little bit more detail, because the comedy in this episode really didn't do anything for me. Yes, Spongebob failing at making milkshakes and a lot of the weirdness of the milkshake camp was amusing, but I wouldn't say that any of it was funny. Overall, I can see some good ideas here with the whole milkshake academy, and the montage and the climax were nice, but the episode just wasn't very funny, and I feel it just didn't push its content concept far enough. This one was close to being good, but I think it is meh. As it stands now, it's a cool novelty that I don't regret watching once, but don't really care about watching again. One interesting note though is that Spongebob's milkshake license first appeared in the episode Yours, Mine, and Mine. So that episode was probably somewhat of an inspiration for the writers to come up with this one. Pretty cool to see a one-off gag inspire a whole episode.
Episode 181B, Squid Baby. Squidward suffers from a head injury and reverts back to being an infant. If it's one thing the show has taught me, it's that head injuries are always context sensitive. Sometimes you might hit your head and become handsome. Other times you might hit your head and become a baby. It really just kind of depends on what's going on in the episode. But jokes aside, this is not a very good episode. First of all, I have to point out that it is similar to Rockabye Bivalve. We've already had an episode with SpongeBob and Patrick taking care of a kid, and that one was actually funny. It's kind of getting ridiculous that almost every episode this season thus far feels heavily similar to another episode. But hey, that's just what happens when your show goes on for nine seasons. The show kind of calls attention to this as well when Patrick is watching TV and ignoring the baby. The sounds coming from the TV are the same sounds that came from the TV he was watching in Rockabye Bivalve. If this episode was any good, that might be intentionally calling back to a similar episode, but because this episode stinks, it just serves to remind me of something that I should should be watching instead. So why does this episode stink like Squidward's dirty diaper? Well, here's the thing. It contains a little bit of everything in terms of things that I don't like about Spongebob episodes. It's got really infantile humor, especially at the beginning with Spongebob and Patrick acting like babies. I mean, they've done many childlike and weird things before, but straight up acting like babies out in public? Yeah, that's really weird, even for these two. The episode also features excessive crying with Squidward, and it's similar to another episode, Rockabye Bivalve, it's got a bit of squid torture in there too, and they top it all off with toilet humor. Now here's the thing, each one of these things in the episode isn't too bad on its own. The excessive crying is relatively understandable, and even though it is pretty similar to Rockabye Bivalve, it's not a direct copy of the episode, it does take it to a slightly different place. The squid torture here isn't too bad, as at least Spongebob and Patrick are trying to keep Squidward safe, and they do seem horrified when they get him accidentally hurt, and the toilet humor is mostly just isolated to one joke about a poopy diaper, although that one joke goes on for a while, and man, do they make it clear that 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 is a very full diaper. My point is just that none of these things are too bad on their own, but altogether makes for a pretty bad episode. And it's not funny. I could see the episode trying to make jokes, but a lot of it is just really awkward considering it's, you know, adult Squidward in a baby diaper. I feel like this sort of concept was a lot less weird and creepy in Goo Goo Gas. Yeah, it's a Stumbaugh episode. It's certainly not unwatchably bad, but it's definitely bad. Though I must admit that there are at least little glimpses of good ideas is here and there. There are moments in the episode where Squidward is kind of cute, and I do like that the problem was solved with the ice machine. Typically this sort of thing is just solved with more blunt trauma to the head, but instead of going down that route, they went with something that does make somewhat logical sense, although in an obvious cartoony way, in that ice usually brings down swelling. Oh, and if you're curious as to what that little purple leg down there means, I wouldn't blame you because it's been a while, but hey, the my leg gag is back, sort of. A character runs away saying, my face, my face, also my leg, but mostly my face. And he's voiced by Mr. Lawrence. Even though it's not a direct use of that one particular my leg clip, that is pretty clearly a reference to the my leg gag, which is pretty cool. I just wish it had been done in a better episode. Episode 182A, Little Yellow Book. Squidward reads Spongebob's diary. So, believe it or not, this episode has a great significance to the every episode of Spongebob Reviewed series. By around March of 2013, I had done a number of Spongebob reviews of individual episodes and had concluded that all of the newer episodes of the show were just not good. After doing this, though, I decided that was pretty unfair of me to generalize a bunch of seasons of the show like that. So, I wanted to check out one of the latest episodes, and Wouldn't you know it, Little Yellow Book was on Hulu. And this was the last episode of Spongebob I watched before embarking on this journey to review every episode. Yes, I thought this episode was actually pretty bad, but it did make me want to know what had happened to Spongebob, how we got from season three and four all the way up to this. And a few months later, I premiered the every episode of Spongebob season one reviewed video. But enough about me, let me talk about the episode. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that there actually were jokes in this episode that I liked. The I had a brother once joke, the stealing a hairpin from Mr. Krabs and his hair going all poofy, the old guy that fell in the toilet. I liked all three of those gags, but those were definitely not funny enough to save what is a Stumbob episode otherwise. There's a few things I don't like here, but I'm going to start with Spongebob's weird secrets. Why does Spongebob turn into a chicken when he sees plaid, and why does he get naked when he hears the Bikini Bottom National Anthem? What is the reason for these things? 
things. I mean, I know, sure, SpongeBob, wacky, weird, whatever, but they made him pretty dang weird in this episode. It didn't make me laugh, it just kind of makes me think that there's something seriously wrong with SpongeBob. Then there's the whole civilians of Bikini Bottom thing. So, when Squidward is making fun of SpongeBob and reading his diary, all of the civilians of Bikini Bottom were laughing right along with him. And SpongeBob even comes out at one point, and Squidward shows off the weird things he can make SpongeBob do, knowing what he knows from the diary. So the Bikini Bottomites clearly see SpongeBob and know it's him, but yet somehow they act surprised that it's SpongeBob later. And throughout the rest of the episode, they throw a giant hissy fit that Squidward read SpongeBob's diary. Now look, I get that this is supposed to be ironic. It's supposed to be like, haha, they're singling out Squidward, even though they're just as guilty. But it's just way too much here. They don't do it in a funny way. They just do it in a really nasty and hypocritical way, especially Patrick. And yes, Squidward does call Patrick out on this, but that's about all the punishment that Patrick's gonna get, and Patrick is supposedly Spongebob's best friend. I don't like these elements, but really what I think makes this story fail is that it goes exactly nowhere. Squidward reads the diary and embarrasses Spongebob, but then after that, all it is is Squidward just repeatedly being yelled at by Bikini Bottomites, inexplicably losing his house, and being put in stockades because he dared read a diary. I don't really have a problem with Squidward being punished for doing a bad thing. And I also don't have a problem with the show treating diary reading as if it's some serious crime. But what I do have a problem with is that that is what the rest of the episode is. Squidward doesn't change or learn. No one tries to read Squidward's diary. There's no interesting turn here. It's just people being down on Squidward. Yes, he deserves it, but no, this doesn't make a good story. And even when you think he might change his ways, of course he doesn't, because they gotta go with the stupid comedy ending of her dur, he's still reading diaries. It's also one of those things where it feels like this episode would be a lot more interesting if it were actual characters calling out Squidward, not just random background fish. Like if Sandy was there and continuously harped on Squidward and made him feel guilty, or tried to get revenge for SpongeBob by reading his diary. Or if Mr. Krabs had gone a little bit further, he does try to make Squidward feel bad, but then after that he disappears from the episode. If you compare it to something like Fools in April, Squidward feels bad and tries to apologize and the conflict of the episode is that Squidward has a hard time apologizing to Spongebob. There's a conflict there, there's something actually happening. Here, nothing of the sort happens. Squidward half-heartedly tries to apologize for all of half of a second, but it doesn't even stick. And Spongebob's whole, oh well I published the book and everyone seemed to like it and everything is good now, is so fake feeling. With how upset he was earlier, it just means that Spongebob takes a random left turn just for an even bigger take that at Squidward. I'm not upset because Squidward got punished for his actions. The story bothers me because it goes nowhere and it just spends a very long time calling out Squidward. It's just a really negative episode. The first part is spent making fun of Spongebob and the second part is putting Squidward down. There were a few jokes I laughed at, but nothing that redeems the rest of the episode. Oh, and by the way, Spongebob previously had a diary in boating school and gone. 182B. Bumper to bumper. Mrs. Puff takes Spongebob to an abandoned road to teach him how to drive. So right off the bat, one of the things I like about this episode is that Mrs. Puff actually tries to teach Spongebob, and acknowledges that it's his own anxieties that's preventing him from being able to drive. So while it's a bit of an unusual plan, taking him out to just an abandoned highway in the middle of nowhere is actually a good idea. And although, yes, she definitely wants to get rid of Spongebob, she's not anywhere near as harsh as she was the last time she was featured. It does feel like they put her back in the place of being a teacher who's just frustrated with having a student who is unteachable. Which, by the way, Spongebob was also declared unteachable way back in Mrs. Puff, You're Fired. On the side of comedy for this episode, it is relatively light. There are gags there that I like, like the cop's sunglasses and mustache coming down from his helmet, as well as some of the gags about the runaway boatmobile both in the beginning of the episode and towards the end of the episode, but it's certainly not a joke-heavy episode. There are also two elements that felt like they went on for a bit too long. First of all, there's the whole Beavis and Buttfish section, which felt relatively out of place, like it should have been something that was just kind of a one-off gag, and not something that should have continued throughout the whole scene. And additionally, Spongebob's little hypnotized freakout sequence went just a little bit too long for my taste. But the story is good, especially the climax of the episode. I think it is a really action-packed and fun one, especially in HD. Being able to show a 10-lane highway all across the 
wide screen really looks cool. And by the way, I love that this show still uses traditional animation on their cars instead of using CG like a lot of shows these days. In fact, a lot of the aesthetics of the episode look really nice, like the desert area or the parts of SpongeBob's freakout sequence. It is another episode that I think really utilizes the HD well. And the episode has a good energy to it because a lot of it is spent inside of a boatmobile, particularly an out of control boatmobile. It just keeps the episode moving and makes it very action packed. And story wise, it's cool that they set up Mrs. Puff's ankle bracelet earlier in the episode and that paid off at the end. And I think it was a clever way to send her to jail and null and void SpongeBob's test. So yeah, the story is good. It's action packed. It looks really nice. It's a little bit light on humor, but there are jokes there. And even though there are two parts that I would have trimmed down, overall, this is a good episode. Finally, right? Oh, and one interesting note is that remember way back in No Free Rides when inside of Mrs. Puff's house, there's a picture of her being surprised at the door right as she walks in the door being surprised. It's basically a picture on the wall of the same scene that's happening live. By the way, in that video, I mistakenly call it the SquarePants family's house when it's actually Mrs. Puff's. Well, they brought that gag back for some inexplicable reason. And inside Mrs. Puff's house, yet again, is a picture of her sitting on the couch while she is sitting on the couch. It has to be one of the strangest and most surreal gags in Spongebob history, and they decided to bring it back. That's actually pretty cool. 183A. Eek! An urchin! The Krusty Crew and Plankton must team up to catch an urchin and the Krusty Krab. I'm really amazed that it took nine seasons for them to do a story about some sort of pest problem in the kitchen. Sure, the Krusty Krab has had fungus before, but this is just a story idea that seems kind of obvious. And I don't mean to say that it's bad, it's just a good fit for a show about a guy who works at a fast food joint. One of the things I really like about this episode is the camaraderie between four characters who are kind of enemies with each other. Plankton working with Krab, Squidward working with Spongebob. It's not stuff you see super often, so it's cool to see all four of them coming together to defeat a common foe. And there's never any backstabbing by Plankton, though Krabs kinda does leave him for dead. Another thing I really like is the urchin itself. I love how it's animated, I love its big cartoony tongue, I love its purple outline, I love how fast it moves. Though there has been urchins on the show before, particularly in Nature Pants and in a lot of the backgrounds on rocks, we've never really seen this much of any given urchin and and I like the redesign here instead of going with just a black dot with some lines sticking out of it. And I like the comedy in the episode, especially involving the urchin. I like it bouncing off of Mr. Krabs' tongue, bouncing all around SpongeBob, almost getting eaten by several Krusty Krab customers. It's weird crush on Plankton. It's all pretty funny. It's a good episode. There's a lot to like here, and I think it's been the funniest episode of season nine yet. The only thing I don't like about it is the ending, and that's because it's just one of those really obvious endings and it goes on for a bit too long. Yes, Spongebob went all the way around the world and ended up back at the Krusty Krab where he releases the urchins again. Duh. This gag has been done before on the show. But that's just the ending, and that's the only bad thing I can say about the episode. Also of note is that this is the first episode that had the HD Spongebob opening. It didn't have it on first airing, but a rerun of this episode was the very first one to have it. Though I will be talking about this more in Season 9B, because technically it didn't premiere until we were already into Season 9B. Episode 183B, Squid Defense. Sandy and Spongebob teach Squidward karate for self-defense. So the very first thing I have to point out is that this episode is very similar to Karate Star. A new character learns karate, then uses it to do bad things. And while the details of the story might be different, the same basic concept is there. Even the title card is similar. It makes me wonder if there's gonna be an episode in the future where Plankton learned karate off screen and Krabs needs to learn it from Sandy and Spongebob so that he's able to fight Plankton in some sort of big competition competition. Call it the Karate Crab or something. I don't really have a huge problem with them reusing the X character learns karate episode, but though it's not that big a negative, it's not a positive either. And besides being similar, the story itself is very predictable. I was really hoping that the tough guy was going to turn out to be an actual tough guy, but no, of course, it was just a wacky misunderstanding. And the episode does the whole karate kid thing of you gotta master these mundane tasks to be good at karate, but it really doesn't put too much of a a fun Spongebobby twist on it. It's just Squidward doing chores. And the episode isn't even funny. The only thing I kind of sort of laughed at was Tangled Squidward, where he gets all his tentacles stuck to him, and Spongebob saying he should have named Gary Scary, if only because of how lame a joke that was. I really didn't think this at first, but after dissecting each part of the episode, I have to say, Scumbob episode. 
A light one, to be sure, but there's so little comedy, the story is predictable, and there's no fun twists on it at all. It's just an episode that really adds nothing. I would much prefer to watch Karate Star. I should point out that this is finally a Sandy and Squidward episode, but that's somewhat ruined by the fact that A, Spongebob is there the whole time, and B, they don't really play with that at all. Not like in Perfect Chemistry, where they kind of have fun with the pairing of Plankton and Sandy, here they just kind of treat it like it's a normal thing that Squidward and Sandy hang out. It's definitely not the buddy cop movie that I had imagined, though there is crime fighting in it. Without that stupid twist ending, this would be at least a meh, but because it's there, it deflates a lot of the tension and intrigue that was happening in the beginning of the episode. Once you know that he's never in any danger, or you just assume it like I do because it's super predictable, the episode just becomes tedious, like it's building up to a non-event. I wanted to like this episode. It's got Squidward and Sandy in it together, there's a decent justification for why Squidward wants to learn karate, and I'm usually a sucker for these karate episodes anyway. But it's just so bland. It's not one of those super awful episodes with really obvious bad things in it, but there's really very, very little here that I actually enjoyed. 184A, Jailbreak. Plankton and his fellow inmates utilize the power of chum to break out of prison. Fun fact, Plankton's prison number is 655321, and that would be your useless information of the day. It's very rare that we get to actually see Plankton in jail. That hasn't happened too many times on the show, and the only one I can remember off the very top of my head is the beginning of Krabby Road. But it makes sense. Plankton is a criminal, and presumably Krabs occasionally calls the cops on him. And it's refreshing to see a different location. Sure, we've seen prisons on this show a few times before, with doing time being the most obvious. But definitely not very frequently, and it's nice to have another episode set there. It's also pretty cool that all the criminals idolize Plankton. I did not see that coming. I expected everyone to hate Plankton. It's a nice subversion, and it really does help us see that despite his numerous failures, Plankton does have street cred in the seedy underground. And and the reason is pretty funny as well. The fact that everyone just inexplicably uses chum to commit all their crimes because it's such an awful, awful substance. So yeah, I like the story, and it's a decently funny episode as well. The guards all filling in the wall and then finding out they're stuck like that, as well as a lot of Plankton's lines like, are we at the airport? When there's a fist heading his way with an airplane sound effect playing. That's not a super funny episode, but it's funny enough. It's a good episode. It's a very different feeling Plankton episode, and it's a lot of fun, with a lot of really creative elements. Oh, and it's also really cool to see all of the designs of the criminals. I like that they went with an assortment of creatures instead of just making them all generic fish. Oh, and while I'm on the subject, apparently Plankton got over his fear of whales, but I really don't think anyone would mind that an episode contradicts the events of One Course Meal. Episode 184B, Evil Spatula. Plankton uses a mechanical spatula to trick SpongeBob into revealing the formula. So, we've already had an episode where SpongeBob loses his spatula and has to get a new one that turns out to be a jerk. Though there are superficial comparisons between this and all that glitters, they're really not that similar, and they go in very different directions. However, the direction this goes in is just not very good. Plankton's plan is complicated, sure, but it's not like it's really clever or that interesting. Plankton disguises himself as something to earn SpongeBob's trust and trick the formula out of him. They've done that. A lot. And the way Plankton is foiled is just really anticlimactic. Plankton has this crazy elaborate plan, and all that it needs to be ruined is SpongeBob mentioning that the spatula belonged to Plankton. Plankton doesn't do anything crazy to reveal himself, Spongebob doesn't figure it out, no, all it takes is Krabs hearing that the spatula was from Plankton, which I mean, yeah, you'd be very suspicious if it was from Plankton, but that's a really lame way for his plan to be foiled. Though Mr. Krabs tricking Plankton into using an explosive material to brew the formula, and the subsequent explosion, was actually a pretty good way to end the episode, and I especially like the moment that Plankton realizes that the jig is up. They have a nice little beat before the explosion where you could just see on Plankton's face that he knows he's in trouble. As far as other things I liked, there's really not too many. I do like the setup at the beginning with Mr. Krabs and Spongebob washing the dirty money, because it's just a very interesting and unique lead-up to the episode that makes sense for Mr. Krabs. And there's also a moment of the Krusty Krab customers being ravenous, which was pretty good. Otherwise, everything else about it is standard. Not necessarily bad, just standard. This isn't a great story, and there's not really too many comedic moments, but I also wouldn't necessarily call it bad. It's just 
meh. To be honest, I wasn't that far off from calling this a scumbob. It is similar to a lot of other Plankton episodes, but there were just enough little amusing things in there for me to bump this up to the meh. And I really don't have much to say beyond that, other than the fact that I found it really gross that Spongebob has no problem using his spatula to clean Gary's litter box. Sure, he's done some unhygienic things on the show before with food, but that one just strikes me as really gross. And not too much later, he uses it as a toothbrush as well. Ugh. Episode 185. It came from Goo Lagoon. Plankton hijacks a mysterious goo blob to use as a weapon. After how great season 8 did with its multiple science fiction inspired episodes, it was nice to see that season 9 brought it back in special form. Although if you think about it, it's a Spongebob Christmas is actually a pretty science fiction-y plot as well. With a mysterious substance that everyone thinks is super harmless and ignores the scientist's expert opinion until that blob turns evil. Well, I guess it doesn't really turn evil so much as Plankton is and he started piloting the thing. Anyway, this is a really fun episode. I like what they do with messing around with the goo in the beginning. Spongebob and Patrick bouncing around on it, Squidward using it as hair, just all sorts of little wacky things they do with it. It's a really nice way to start off the episode. There's also a nice build up to the mystery of what these goo blobs are and exactly what they can do. When Sandy starts going on about how they're dangerous and they could potentially destroy all of Bikini Bottom, which ultimately turns out to be a very big exaggeration. The worst the goo blob does is just make a big mess everywhere. But still, it provides a lot of tension and excitement in the episode, which leads into a fun chase and Sandy and SpongeBob coming up with ways to try to save Bikini Bottom from this goo blob. It's really got all the pieces, action, fun, excitement, tension. I wouldn't say it's quite as good as the Krabby Patty that ate Bikini Bottom or Planet of the Jellyfish, but I do think it is a good episode. It's always cool to see Sandy taking charge and kicking butt. Heck, even Patrick is actually kind of funny in the episode. Sure, he's stupid, but in a more childish and less mean way. On the comedy side of things, it's not a really funny episode, but there is a nice amount of jokes in here, and they're spaced out nicely between the action and the fun of messing around with the goo. Jokes like the goo coming out of the water and into the water. Patrick calling his new friend SpongeBob. Sandy and SpongeBob stealing Squidward's bicycle only to take it like three feet to her tree dome. Also, I'm amazed that this episode didn't end with SpongeBob absorbing the big goo blob. But in this case, it was solved with bubbles. So I guess I'll amend my statement and say that everything is solved with absorption and bubbles. The biggest failing though, I think, is the ending. The fact that the goo bubble pops and it turns out that it just covers everything in goo. After all the buildup, I was expecting, I don't know, maybe a little bit more. I know it's Spongebob, and I know that covering everything in goo is a big threat to Bikini Bottom, but still, after all the effort spent trying to make sure this thing doesn't pop, having it just pop and then not be that big a deal, yeah, it's a bit of a letdown. This is another one of those comedy endings, and I get why they decided to do it this way. I don't think it's awful, but I do think it kind of cheapens the episode to show the bubble actually popping and having it not be that big a deal. Episode 186A, Safe Deposit Crabs. Mr. Krabs gets trapped in a bank vault. This episode feels like a whole lot of wasted potential. Mr. Krabs being trapped in a bank vault and SpongeBob and Patrick having to break in to rescue him both sound like good ideas, but they don't really do much with either of them. And I guess it's because the episode's attention is split between too many things. They have to set up what the bank is in a commercial, and then there's a bit of Mr. Krabs trying to get into the bank and getting kicked out repeatedly. So by the time he finally gets trapped in the bank vault and then SpongeBob finds out about it, there isn't really much time for either of the two stories to play out. SpongeBob and Patrick breaking in amounts to basically two different methods, trying to go in through the roof, which leads to them being ejected from another building, and them trying to break in through the front door when the manager opens it up. And that's it. It's not like there's a bunch of plans, it's not like either of these plans are really that interesting or fun or funny, there's just not much to it. And then as far as Mr. Krebs being trapped in the bank vault, he makes a woman out of money and starts dating her, okay, and then then, all of a sudden, it transitions to him thinking that he's trapped on some sort of deserted island with her, and there's a giant money-eating monster, and the island's on fire, and he starts going insane. This is because, according to the episode, Mr. Krabs is running out of oxygen, but I don't get why they had to go with this deserted island thing. Was there so little ideas for what to do with Mr. Krabs in the bank vault that suddenly have to transport him to another deserted location? Why not have him get lost inside a jungle full of money? Or maybe he loses that one penny that he cared so much for at the beginning of the episode amongst all the piles of money and has to go searching for it, maybe learning some sort of lesson about sentimental value over financial value, or something. I don't know, there's a 
lot of ideas that they could have done with this, but they really just don't do that much. And the ending is disappointing. The solution is that the bank manager just lets SpongeBob in and frees Mr. Krabs. SpongeBob's attempts to break in mean absolutely nothing, and Krabs doesn't really do anything to try to escape his situation. So from a story perspective, not a lot actually happens. As far as things I liked about the episode, I liked that Pearl tells Spongebob to just call Mr. Krabs because it's such a simple, mundane solution and it makes a lot of sense. It's especially great with Pearl's reaction and acting like this was incredibly obvious. Also, uh, Mr. Krabs' butt sticking out of the safe deposit box was kinda funny, I guess? That's really all I've got. It's not an abysmal episode, but it just is so lacking in every way. It's not funny, the story seems to be too split up, and it just doesn't run with its premise. I'm gonna say it's a Stumbob episode. This was another one that I think was pretty close to meh, because I don't strongly hate it, and it's not like there's any elements that are really bad or really annoying or really frustrating, it's just an episode that does not come together in any way. If they had focused on Spongebob and Patrick breaking in, then yeah, they probably could have told a better story. Or if they had just focused on Mr. Krabs inside the vault, then you probably could have done a lot with that too. But the episode just doesn't have that much focus. And really, above all else, it's just boring. Weak story, weak comedy, and I found myself just not really caring. Oh, and, uh... Fun fact, this is Pearl's first appearance in Season 9. But it's definitely not her most major appearance. 186B, Plankton's pet. Plankton adopts a pet amoeba. Hey, where's Spot? Oh, there he is. Out of all the characters that had personality changes after the first Spongebob movie, Plankton has definitely been affected the absolute least. He's stayed pretty in character and fun the whole time. However, the one downside of Plankton is that almost all of his stories revolve around him wanting to steal the formula. And though there's been many clever twists on that over the years, and of course I don't want them to stop doing those episodes altogether, it is always nice when they do something a little bit different with the character. Like the time he traded places with crabs just to see what it would be like, or whenever he has to team up with Krabs. It's always really refreshing and fun to see something like this, an episode that, yes, does reference stealing the formula, but for the most part is just about Plankton finding a different hobby and doing something else. I mean, heck, the beginning of the episode is basically about how Plankton has nothing else going on in his life and Spongebob suggesting he gets a hobby. And I think that his character works really well here. Just because he's evil and steals the formula doesn't mean that he can't have a genuine relationship with a pet. And Plankton works as very sympathetic in the episode without feeling like he's out of character. At its heart, it is just a basic boy and his dog story. Plankton learning the ins and outs of caring for a pet, the pet runs away, Plankton desperately tries to find the pet, and then winds up in danger himself, and the pet saves the day. It is very simple on paper, but the episode works so well, thanks to Plankton being a fun protagonist and how sincere and sweet he is in the episode, as well as how likable this little amoeba spot is. They made him really cute and and I like all the little bits they have with him being tiny and getting squished and being able to multiply his cells to get bigger. Sure, they could have just gone with a worm or something, but this works out so much better because it is original to the show. But it's not just about how likable the characters are here, it's also about how funny the episode is. A lot of the stuff at the beginning, with everyone thinking Mr. Krabs is torturing a baby when it's really Plankton in a mechanical suit, that's actually really dang funny. As well as Plankton accidentally crushing Spot and thinking he killed him. These are morbid jokes, for sure, but they're funny. It's a basic story that just works really well thanks to how likable and enjoyable the characters are, how it puts a character in a situation we've really never seen before, and just how funny it is. It's a very good episode. And I think it's really great that they sell us on this idea that Plankton really does care for this pet, to the point where even when Spot ruins his chances of getting a Krabby Patty, the most Plankton does is want to punish him for about five minutes. Also, I like that there really isn't much of a twist in the episode. Yes, there's a little one with it turning out that Spot was on Plankton's cornea the whole time, but there's no, like, giant twist where Spot was actually just a mechanical pet designed by Plankton to just steal the Krabby Patty formula, or that this whole thing has been a ruse to try to distract Spongebob or something stupid like that. I'm glad that they did keep the focus of the episode on Plankton getting an actual pet that he is genuinely bonding with and not just using as a means to an end. I would much rather have a genuinely sweet ending and episode overall like this than them trying to do some sort of stupid comedy punchline at the end or making Plankton unlikable for the sake of jokes. Oh, and fun fact, apparently Spongebob mentions losing Gary for eight minutes. I was really hoping it was gonna be a reference to Have You Seen the Snail, but instead they decided to go with a gag of how comedically short a time it was that Spongebob lost Gary. 
187A, don't look now, Spongebob and Patrick get spooked by a scary movie. So this episode is basically split into two parts. There's the whole setup with Spongebob and Patrick watching the movie, walking home, getting scared, and annoying Squidward, and then there's the second part where Squidward decides to dress up like the villain from the movie and torment Spongebob and Patrick. As far as the first part goes, it's a little dry. I would have liked more comedy and a little less screaming, though the screaming here isn't that bad and totally justified in story. Story, eh, there could have still been a little bit less of it. And it feels a little bit drawn out with them seeing the movie twice, having Spongebob walk Patrick to his rock, and then Patrick walk Spongebob back to his pineapple. It does just feel a little bit slow and a little bit too much like it's set up. Especially because there's been plenty of other episodes with Spongebob and or Patrick being scared of something. Like when Spongebob was scared of the horror movie in Crab Borg. No, what I see as the real draw of this episode is Squidward essentially becoming a slasher villain and scaring the ever-loving tar out of Spongebob and Patrick. On the surface, this sounds a lot like Graveyard Shift, but in that episode, it was just Squidward telling a scary story. In this one, he's become the scary story. And I really like that aspect. I think this is something that makes sense for Squidward. It's understandable that he'd be annoyed by Spongebob and Patrick screaming all over the place, but he obviously takes it way too far, and in my opinion, he gets what he deserves at the end. Especially with the extra irony that Spongebob and Patrick are trying to save Squidward from this villain. There are a few decent gags in the episode, like how over the top the kissing scene was, and the fish hook digging in Patrick's nose, which is actually a surprise because I'm usually not a big fan of nose picking gags, but something about the way this one played out actually worked pretty well. But overall, it's not a very funny episode. I think it rounds out to be about a meh. My favorite part of the episode was when Spongebob and Patrick were trying to rescue Squid from the fisherman. What makes that scene extra fun is that they play the now that were men music from the Spongebob movie, as Spongebob and Patrick decide to become heroic, and it actually works as a really nice motif. I wish they would do this in other episodes and have it play whenever Spongebob and Patrick did something particularly brave. However, the dumb thing about this is that I think they played the music not because of its ties to the Spongebob movie, but because it's kind of a football anthem and Spongebob and Patrick were making a football play at the time. I really hope they went with it for a direct reference, but knowing how this show is, I doubt it, and unfortunately I think this was just a really nice coincidence. It's an okay episode. I think it's worth checking out once to see Squidward's appearance, but there's not really enough here to warrant a rewatch. Episode 187B, Seance Schmeance. SpongeBob summons ghosts that refuse to leave the Krusty Krab. It's always ghosts with this show, man. Why can't we get like an episode with a mummy or a vampire or a swamp monster or something? Why is it always ghosts? And this one doesn't even have the Flying Dutchman in it. So yeah, that's my first gripe. It's similar to other ghost episodes. It reminds me a little bit of Ghost Host and they use the music and at least one ghost design from Ghoul Fools. I wouldn't say it's a ripoff of any of the other episodes per se, but it is a little bit similar. Additionally, outside of the very opening, I didn't find this episode funny at all. Yes, I did like the really cheesy, weird soap opera about ghosts and toilet paper, but that was about it. I don't know, maybe Spongebob reading from the sacred text of a mustard label was kind of funny as well, but that's being pretty generous. So it's not funny, and it's another ghost episode. Do I have anything good to say about it? Well, I like Mr. Krabs kicking ghost butt at the end. I wish there was a little bit more of that, but that was still pretty cool. And the story itself is decent. I like the setup in that they introduce the concept of a seance and give Spongebob a good reason to do one, all in pretty short time. And in fact, the whole episode is actually paced pretty well. There wasn't really any point that I was bored. Did I like it? No. But I also can't say that I disliked it either. Hmm, if only I had a rating for that. Oh yeah, meh. And in terms of individual aspects of the episode, I find a lot of them to just be middle of the road. The character of Rusty and his weird sandwiches are just eh. I don't find them to be funny or good, but I don't find them to be bad or too boring either. Though those sandwiches are definitely really gross. 188A, Kenny the Cat. SpongeBob idolizes an athlete with a secret. So this episode is weird. It's weird because Spongebob is not known for taking on real life issues. Sure, they might have morals every now and again, but it's usually the generic be kind to others sort of message. It's not the type of show that I would really expect to cover the interesting and complex issue of athletes cheating, because yeah, that's what this is a metaphor for. If the episode had just been about an athlete cheating, then I wouldn't say that it's being particularly topical or referencing real world issues, but because they 
go into the whole argument of, well, even though I'm cheating, I'm making a lot of people happy and a lot of people look up to me, so it's okay and it's a good thing. It definitely seems like they're trying to specifically reference a real life issue here. But of course it just takes the side of cheating is wrong and cheating is bad. So although it is kind of topical, it's not like it's really too political or complicated. Anyway, about the quality of the episode itself, of course I'm going to point out that this is not the first time that Spongebob has idolized over a character who turned out to be less than a hero. First, there was Kevin from I'm Your Biggest Fanatic, and weirdly enough, Patrick also calls Spongebob out for his creepy obsession in this episode as well as that one. It's another one of those cases where it's not a huge deal that this episode is similar because it is taken in a different way, whereas Kevin was a horror jerk to Spongebob, Kenny the Cat is just a dirty cheater. But though it may not be a rip-off, the episode is just meh. For reasons I'm about to explain. First of all, the episode is very poorly paced. There is a lot of buildup, and it does make sense to have it be like that to an extent, because you do want to build up how much Spongebob likes Kenny, but at the same time, because they built it up so much, there wasn't really much time for the main conflict of the episode to actually play out. He arrives at the Krusty Krab, Spongebob almost immediately finds him cheating, they have a discussion over whether or not Spongebob is going to tell, Sandy busts him anyway, and then BAM, the episode is over. Kenny being revealed as a big cheater really didn't actually amount to much. A bunch of people just walked away disappointedly. There really should have been maybe a little bit more to it than that. And if the setup wasn't so long, then they could have definitely put something else there. Nextly, there's the issue of comedy, and that the episode isn't very funny. Yeah, okay, there's maybe one or two jokes I like, like Spongebob breathing a bunch of water into Squidward, or Mr. Krabs thinking that Kenny's been inside his wallet, but most of those jokes are at the beginning, and the episode kind of stops being funny after that. Which leads me to my next issue. It's a little bit melodramatic when Spongebob discovers Kenny's big secret and then has a passionate discussion over whether he should reveal it or not. The show takes it just a little bit too seriously for my liking. The episode needed to be more comedic in general, but those particular scenes should have been a little bit more comedic to lighten the tone. And this is part of the reason why I feel like this episode was trying to be like a ripped from the headlines type story. But because it's Spongebob, which doesn't have any layer of complexity, it doesn't really do that good a job at that. I don't mind there being a more serious conflict but please at least throw a few jokes in there to lighten the mood. But after saying all of that, I find myself in the same position I was when talking about Seance Schmeance, in that although it doesn't really do many things right, I can't really say it does much wrong either. Sure, it might not be paced out in the greatest way, but it did hold my attention through and through. And it was interesting to see an animated cat on the show for the first time. Plus, Bismarcky does a pretty good job voicing him. And I do like that very first scene, which like I said, had some decent jokes in there, and that's why I believe it to be a meh. It has a few problems, and does a few things right. And I do especially like Patrick being creeped out at Spongebob's obsession, because he voiced exactly what I was thinking. Episode 188B, Giddy Crabs. A snow monster terrorizes the Krusty Krab. Before I get into the episode, I want to point out that this episode aired exactly one year after Kenny the Cat, and those are the last two episodes of season 9A. It took them a whole year to air two episodes. Like I said at the beginning, I understand why Nickelodeon held this one because they probably weren't entirely sure when the new episodes made after the second Spongebob movie would actually be finished. So holding this one to make sure they had it just in case the ratings for Nickelodeon dipped really low and they needed to air it was probably a smart idea. Anyway, as far as the actual episode goes, it basically boils down to one thing that happens again and again and again and again. Spongebob doing chores around the Krusty Krab. At first he does them just because he's a good employee, and then he does them because he's afraid that the Yeti Krab will eat him if he doesn't. But that is seriously what the bulk of this episode is, and I didn't find these chores to be funny, but all of them were done in at least mildly amusing ways. Even if it was a bit repetitive and a lot of these tasks I've seen Spongebob do in other episodes. And if Don't Look Now was kind of similar to Graveyard Shift, then the plot of this episode is actually very very similar to Graveyard Shift, where it features a character at the Krusty Krab telling another character a story in order to scare them, and then that thing that they were telling the story about just so happens to show up, which causes a big misunderstanding. Ironically though, this episode has the opposite misunderstanding happen, where it's a real monster that Squidward doesn't believe is real. Again, it's not too similar, but it doesn't really get any points for originality there. As far as the Yeti Krab itself, it's pretty cool. I like the design, I like its mannerisms. I wouldn't say anything about it is really great or really interesting, but there's nothing wrong with it. That's right, it's another 
meh episode. It's not funny, and the story isn't great, but at the same time, it doesn't really have any problems outside of that, and I was at least mildly amused by what happened. It just could have been a little bit more interesting and a little bit less repetitive. My favorite part has to be the fact that Squidward actually did decide to try to stand up for Spongebob, saying that even though he's an idiot, he still doesn't deserve to be treated poorly, which is kind of ironic considering Squidward dressed up as a horror movie character to scare Spongebob only a few episodes ago. All in all, middle of the road stuff. Episode 189 Spongebob, you're fired. I didn't feel like writing a description because it's pretty much in the title. Oh boy, this is a bad episode. Buckle up guys because this is gonna be a long review. Alright, let's just go chronologically here. First off, let's talk about the reason Spongebob is fired. It's because Mr. Krabs can save a nickel. Yeah, it's a stupid comedy herdeater Mr. Krabs is cheap joke. What's annoying about this is that this is the event that sets in motion this whole episode. This also sets up Spongebob being pretty bummed out for the rest of the first half of the episode. It's a big deal and the show treats it like a stupid joke. I don't mind Mr. Krabs joking about him being fired with a pink slip and all that stuff, but I am bothered by the reasoning because that is a plot point. It makes me not want to take this story seriously because of just how stupid it is to fire Spongebob over such a small amount of money when it's obvious that in the long run he should be making a lot more money by employing Spongebob than by not employing him. Like, imagine if in the Spongebob movie, instead of Mr. Krabs not allowing Spongebob to run the Krusty Krab tube because he was too immature, but instead because it would save me a hay penny. That would be stupid. The reason why they didn't do that was because that was an important point that set up the whole movie. Mr. Krabs' decision there had a lot of weight to it. Not only does it set up the plot, but it sets up the core theme of the movie of Spongebob feeling like he's looked down upon for being childlike. But here, it's just a dumb joke. Even in Can You Spare a Dime, when Squidward was fired over a dime, at least in that instance, it was not just because of the dime, but because Mr. Krabs thought he was stealing and because they had a big argument about it. It was more than just literally a dime. And that episode was only 11 minutes long, not nearly as melodramatic as this. And that one was, oh, I don't know, funny? Honestly, I think if Spongebob was going to be fired, Model Sponge did it a lot better than this in how it was a wacky misunderstanding. Sure, that episode is far from perfect, but it's better than this one, and I'd much rather have it be a misunderstanding than him being fired for an incredibly stupid reason. Alright, so after that, we get Depressed Bob Bummer Pants. Unlike Are You Happy Now, at least Spongebob's depression here isn't trying to make light of the actual mental illness, and is instead more depression in the way of something really bad happened to him and he feels sad about it. But just because it's not offensive doesn't mean it's not awful. While it makes sense for SpongeBob to be miserable about what happened to him, none of it is funny in the slightest and it goes on for several minutes. He doesn't snap out of it until halfway through the episode. Again, comparing it back to Model Sponge, at least in that episode they made SpongeBob get over it relatively quickly because it's just a bummer to watch SpongeBob be this miserable for this long. Comparing it back to the Spongebob movie, at least there they made Spongebob be bummed out in a weird, funny, and unusual way, having him get kind of drunk and instead of just being miserable, being really belligerent and grumpy. Here, he's just so low energy and just so depressed. Not only is it not fun to see Spongebob be like this for this long, but it also makes the episode's pacing become really slow. Because everything Spongebob does, he does it in a slow, drawn-out way. Realistically, if this was your dream job and you lost it, you would probably be in the same boat. But remember, this is here to entertain us, and Spongebob is not a drama. You have to be very careful in making your protagonist be this unfunnily bummed out, and make sure it doesn't go on for too long or isn't obnoxious like it is here. So Spongebob being miserable really ruins any potential that the whole fun employment bit could have actually had. And wow, great, Sandy, you're doing things that are incredibly unethical, that's just wonderful. In the second half, half of the episode, Spongebob decides that he needs to get a new job. So of course he goes to all the food places, but uh oh, all Spongebob can make is Krabby Patties. Because that's never been done before, and the worst part about this is that it's not a montage, it's not a bunch of quick cuts, it's a long drawn out thing of Spongebob going to restaurant after restaurant after restaurant where the same thing happens every time. It's as monotonous as Atlantis Square Panis. Having a character do something four times with the same result 
result every time is not an interesting story. You have to vary it up a bit or put it in a montage or something. So after all that, SpongeBob goes home and goes to feed Gary, but he doesn't have any snail po, so he makes his own, which turns out to be like a Krabby Patty because that's all he can make. Oh, wait, no, that would make sense. Instead, he makes really good tasting snail food, which leads to nothing at all. This whole scene of SpongeBob making snail food has nothing to do with anything that happens in the episode. You think maybe it's gonna set up that, oh wow, SpongeBob can actually make snail food, so maybe he'll go to work at a snail food place? But no, no, that's not what happens. So the show just contradicts itself in saying that he can make something other than Krabby Patties for exactly no reason. And then after this, SpongeBob gets kidnapped by the hot dog guy. The one who thought that SpongeBob turning his hot dogs into patties was an abomination? Yeah, apparently he served them to his customers and they loved it. This directly contradicts what actually happens earlier in the episode where he throws the patties on the ground and kicks SpongeBob out. But hey, who needs consistency? Who needs logical sense? It's just a wacky SpongeBob cartoon. No, it's not for the sake of a joke. SpongeBob doesn't point this out. It's just an inconsistency because they didn't care. And instead of just hiring SpongeBob, this guy decided to kidnap him because there's no reasoning. There's none. There's none whatsoever. I don't know. He didn't want to pay SpongeBob. Maybe it was all a ruse. I have no idea because this twist is stupid. And then the pizza guy rescues him. But uh oh, the pizza guy wants to kidnap him too. And so does the Chinese food guy and the taco guy, which leads to all these fast food mascot guys fighting it out over SpongeBob, which incidentally is my favorite part of the episode, but only out of context. In context, it's incredibly out of left field and so far away from what was supposed to be the initial premise of this episode. The scene itself is all right, but its placement in the episode is just baffling. Then SpongeBob is rescued by a Krabby Patty mascot who turns out to be Squidward and surprise of all surprises, the Krusty Krab was horribly run without SpongeBob because that has never happened on the show and wasn't the most obvious way to bring him back to the Krusty Krab. Look, I get it. It's obvious to everyone that he's gonna end up back at the Krusty Krab at the end of the episode, but that's no reason to just completely phone in the excuse to get him back. Come on, do something different. Give us something better than this. It's a Scumbob episode. And you probably saw that coming, right? But didn't I make the ride to get there enjoyable and interesting, even though where I was going to end up was pretty obvious? Hmm, if only this episode did that. But no, this is just a abysmal. The episode has no focus with random scenes that have nothing to do with anything. A completely awful reason for the story to even happen in the first place is stupidly melodramatic and slow, and almost everything that happens in it feels so been there, done that. Even the name of the episode is very similar to Mrs. Puff, You're Fired. Was there any good jokes in here? I have no idea because I was too distracted by how awful this story is. And the ending to the episode was the most bland and predictable thing to ever happen in SpongeBob. And by the way, had exactly nothing to do with the events of the episode. You could show the beginning of the episode, do a time card that says one day later, and then show the ending of the episode and you would lose exactly zero information. Great story, right? Where everything the protagonist does has exactly nothing to do with the main conflict. I'd be willing to bet that this episode came about because Nickelodeon wanted something that was going to guarantee them high ratings. The fact that it has a super attention-grabbing title like Spongebob You're Fired, combined with how awful the episode is, really makes me feel like this was an executive's idea and that the people working on this episode did not want to be working on this episode. And it really stands out given the fact that there is nothing else this season that is anywhere near as bad as this episode. I feel like I need to take a break from the show after watching this three times. It really is that bad and one of the worst of the series. And that is every episode of Spongebob Season 9 A Reviewed. I'm not even going to bother wasting the time to build this up. This half season is meh. It's meh in the same way that season four is meh, in that there's a lot of meh episodes, most of the good episodes aren't actually that good, and most of the bad episodes aren't actually that bad. I'm only going to compare it chart-wise to the other meh seasons, because that's what's really interesting. And you're going to want to ignore the numbers on this and just look at the charts, because those are of course full seasons, and this is only a little under half of one. And percentage-wise, this has more meh than any of the others. This isn't very surprising though, the longer a show goes on, the more difficult 
difficult it is to not repeat yourself and to come up with some fresh ideas. There are a lot of episodes this season, almost all of them in fact, that remind me of another episode or a few other episodes that the show has done before. This isn't always an awful thing, but it's a surefire sign that your show has gone on too long. And it's not purely the fact that they're similar to other episodes that's problematic, it's the fact that they don't bring new things to the table as well. Is 9A better than season 8? No. Honestly, I think they're about the same. There is absolutely overall less frustrating elements in 9A and 8, but the problem is that the humor still just isn't really there, and most of the stories are just too weak to stand on their own without the comedy. And while I give the show credit for at least staying consistent and not having 9A be worse than 8, personally, I don't think season 9 is the big second coming of good Spongebob. Well, the first 20 episodes anyway. We still do have all of 9B to cover, but before that I want to talk briefly about the new HD title sequence. So with the show switching to HD, they pretty much had to have a new theme song. It just kind of looks bad to have the theme be in standard definition and the show be in high definition. It also leads certain people at Amazon to think that the show is broadcast in 4.3 instead of widescreen and completely screw up the aspect ratio, thus smooshing some episodes. But I digress. As I said when talking about the switch to HD in general, Spongebob is a show that really tries hard not to change much over the seasons. So having to switch the theme song is a a pretty big deal. Instead of having an entirely new theme, they basically just recreated the old one but in HD. And I think that's a pretty smart decision, seeing as any change that they made would have probably been met with a lot of criticism and resistance. After all, I might find the song itself to be a bit annoying, but the whole intro sequence is very iconic. So yeah, it pretty much is the same exact sequence, with a few minor tweaks. For instance, they use the newer SpongeBob logo. I think that they did a fantastic job and there's only one thing to complain about, and I'm definitely not the first one to say this, but the iconic island that has always been right over Bikini Bottom is for some reason now in CG. In general, I don't have a problem with the show using CG, they have plenty of times in the past. I have a problem with the fact that the CG looks very obvious here, and not only that, but episodes of the show also use this new CG island. If I had to guess, I would say they changed it because maybe they wanted to use more interesting angles than just the one in scenes above the surface like in Lame and Fortune, but that's only one guess and I'm not sure that entirely explains it. For whatever the reason though, it definitely looks bad. But everything else in the theme song is pretty well adapted. And now, let's dive into Spongebob 9B. Episode 190A, Lost in Bikini Bottom. SpongeBob finds himself stranded in a strange part of town. So the first thing I'm going to say is that this is actually a pretty educational episode, teaching kids the definition of a line, as well as Sandy's survival tip being a legitimately good tip, and that you should look for landmarks if you get lost. This is a quaint little episode. Nothing flashy or special, no big laughs or particularly memorable moments, but it's enjoyable nonetheless, albeit in a modest way. The focus is almost entirely placed on SpongeBob just being himself in a new location, trying to overcome a simple simple yet relatable dilemma. And I really like how they give Squidward a nice little quiet moment too. It really says something when my favorite part of the episode is indeed the atmosphere. Because the episode has more quiet moments than most others, and I think that's a good thing. The show doesn't always have to be loud and flashy to be funny. And Squidward's scenes serve as a nice juxtaposition with Spongebob frantically running around yelling and being lost, and Squidward just having a chill day. It does a good job breaking up the episode. But additionally, I like this weird location of this rundown part of Bikini Bottom and the part where Spongebob can't recognize his broken hydrant because there's broken hydrants everywhere feels like a very classic Spongebob joke, almost rock bottom-esque. My main complaint is that the ending goes on too long and really doesn't have much to do with the rest of the episode. Like, it wasn't about Spongebob being clean or dirty or anything like that, so why they spend all this time focusing on Mr. Krabs sending him back home because he's dirty, and then Squidward trying to get himself dirty and then getting hosed off by Mr. Krabs, it really just seems out of place for the type of episode they were trying to tell, and a more fitting ending would have been Spongebob being sent home, and then along the way deciding to take a shortcut, and we end on him being lost yet again. Or heck, maybe a similar thing happening to Squidward on his way home from work. But the ending punchline of the free coupons not actually being free was a bit obvious, and the Squidward part really doesn't tie back to much of anything. However, outside of that, I do like this episode and would consider it good. It won't be making any top five lists anytime soon, 
but it's certainly a charming little episode with a few nice jokes thrown in, like Spongebob's face coming out of the toilet and the gag with Old Man Jenkins being stuck to Spongebob's wire. Not to mention the weird jerky guys on the couch drinking soda. Episode 190B, Tudor Sauce. Mr. Krabs attempts to teach Spongebob how to drive. The craziest thing about this episode is that not only does Krabs give Pearl money without even a single hesitation, but also the fact that Spongebob is costing Krabs thousands of dollars, and although he's certainly not happy about it, he is definitely not overreacting or even really that angry. It's always nice and refreshing to see episodes that are about Krabs that have very little to do with money. And here, the money is mostly just used as a punchline for how much Spongebob is costing Krabs, and of playing into the plot in a big way. And though yes, Krabs is teaching Spongebob because he wants Spongebob to go back to cooking normal patties and making him money, there is also a sense that A, he actually cares about Spongebob and wants him to do well, and B, it's also fueled by Krabs' ego in wanting to not fail at this task. All this to say that I like Krabs' characterization in the episode. I also like the weird realistic touches, like when the Krusty Krab gets destroyed, not only is it costing Mr. Krabs money, we actually see a repairman having to fix it. And of of course, then there's the end of the episode, where after Mr. Krabs uses Gary to show Spongebob that anyone can drive, he gets in trouble with the law for it. Which is just a nice little surprise twist, because in a cartoon like Spongebob, really anything can happen, such as a snail driving a boat, and it doesn't look too out of the ordinary, but of course, when you apply a real-world context, then yeah, what Krabs did was horribly negligent. The episode's also pretty funny. The bulk of it is just these rapid-fire gags of Spongebob driving and crashing into the Krusty Krab in various ways. They mix up the gag just enough so it doesn't get repetitive and boring, and instead they use the various twists on it to heighten the joke. Like the one time when Spongebob doesn't crash into the Krusty Krab, he causes all these other cars to crash into it. There's also other decent gags, like the police officer who is married to his job, and Pearl crashing through the Krusty Krab in a joke that has some great timing. It has a good setup and understandable reasons for why the characters are doing what they're doing, then it contains a bunch of gags, and then it elevates to an interesting climax at the the roundabout, followed by a pretty funny ending. All in all, I'd say it's pretty good. The jokes in this episode aren't amazingly hilarious, but they're all at least chuckle-worthy. And I like the fact that they tie in that Krabs has a teenage daughter who would be about driving age that, of course, he helped out, because that's typically what parents do for their kids once they get their learner's permit. Episode 191A, Squid Plus One A. Er, Squid Plus One. Squidward struggles to find someone to take with him to a fancy event. So right off the bat, I was getting New Fish in Town vibes, where it was another episode about Squidward finding a new person that he could relate to, because he really has no friends. But this episode doesn't really have that much in common with the other one. They're just similar thematically, which is perfectly fine. But the episode is also very mundane. It's a Squidward episode, and he doesn't interact with Spongebob that much, and he's not in any sort of crazy situation, so it can come off as a bit dry. I mean, look, I love Squidward, but he is definitely at his best when he's reacting to something crazy going on or playing off Spongebob. That said, the more I watched this episode, the more I liked this episode. There are some funny things in here, like Squidward's giant head when he's yelling at Spongebob, Norton's big, long anti-clarinet speech, which is funny because of how articulate he is about the subject, as well as his other speech after Squidward leaves, and the fact that the jet ski keeps appearing in the episode as Squidward and Larry hang out, and then again at the very end, randomly taking pictures on the red carpet. Oh, and there's what the announcer fish has to say at the end about Squidward's little performance piece. And let's not forget, Squidward's shouting to the heavens that he's an introvert, which, if you didn't pick up on it, is ironic. And if you can believe it, this episode actually has a Rolodex joke that I enjoy. Having Squidward find a number that turns out to be a bunch of bugs is a really creative and funny gag. Huh, now that I listed them all out, I do have to say this episode is actually pretty funny, albeit in a more subtle way than most. I think story-wise, though, the episode suffers a little bit in the fact that Norton the Malefish disappears a little over halfway in. And right when things were getting interesting with him, too. It's sad because he doesn't even reappear at the end of the episode. And then the stuff with Larry just feels a little... brief. For the most part, their friendship is just that montage. I would say that the episode would have been much better off if it had either entirely focused on Squidward and Norton's friendship, or if it had been about Squidward going to many different characters in Bikini Bottom, 
trying to be friends with each one of them before something goes wrong. So basically either focus on the one relationship or get out a whole bunch of them in quick succession. As the way it's split up now feels like both Larry and Norton could have used a little bit more time. But at the same time, there are still clever things about the story. Like Squidward being a big hypocrite with Larry in that that's exactly what Norton did to him. And I thought the ending was really clever as well. Instead of going with something cheesy and predictable like Squidward just brings Spongebob, he brings Spongebob doing a performance art piece where he rolls around a mirror so Squidward can pretend that he's going with himself, which was foreshadowed throughout the entire episode as Squidward keeps talking to himself in the reflection. While I was initially kind of bored with this episode, the more I watched it, the more I saw little things that I liked. And you know what? I do think it is a good episode. Thanks in part to some good jokes and a very solid ending, as well as the interesting character that is Norton. The episode could have been a little more interesting, but what we get here is something that is enjoyable enough to be called good. 191B, The Executive Treatment. Patrick finds himself caught up in the world of big business. So the fact that my favorite part of the episode is just a few seconds in an elevator is a good clue to the fact that I don't think this is a good episode. As for why I like that part, I don't know, something about Patrick's relaxed face and the elevator music, it's just like a sweet, tiny little moment. As far as the episode as a whole though, well... I definitely appreciate what they were going for. With all the business humor, like the executives only talking in weird business speak that actually means nothing, and extensive use of charts. But though I can definitely see them making jokes, I have to say that it all falls very flat for me. I don't find anything in this episode funny. But I could very easily see someone with slightly different tastes from myself really liking these jokes. I don't think that they're particularly unfunny, I just don't think that they land quite as well as they should. Like, after you've heard the opening scene with all the business people using their businessy terms, you're kind of already sick of that one joke that they keep using throughout the whole episode. They don't really vary it up enough in my opinion. But I think the biggest misstep of all is this business manager boss, played by Frank Ferrente, who is a guy who is apparently known for imitating Groucho Marx. But that's the issue. In this episode, this business manager, although he looks intimidating, is acting like an old-timey comedian. Cha-cha-cha. And of all of the different ways ways they could have made this character act, this one just seems like totally out of place, and not in a funny juxtaposition kind of way. Like it would have been great if this boss character was legitimately big and threatening and comedically serious. Or if they wanted to go the comedian angle, they could have made him up to be more like a completely incompetent boss that everyone puts up with for some reason, like Michael Scott from The Office. But that's not how they do it. He's this weird mix of kind of looking and somewhat acting, a little bit threatening, but also being just this comedian that just doesn't feel right in this role. It just feels like so much wasted potential and there's just something very off about it. Aside from him though, the episode as a whole is very montage -y. There's a montage of the business people talking at the beginning of the episode. There's this montage of Patrick getting swept away to the business building. There's this montage of him doing businessy things. As far as the story goes, it's very bare bones. But after all the negatives I've had to say about this episode, I can also say that it's relatively pleasant. It's not funny, and the story isn't great, but Patrick here is likable, and there is something really endearing about Patrick being swept up in this situation that he is not equipped to handle, and all the poor guy wants is just to get a sandwich. As weird as it is, for all the faults this episode has, Patrick is definitely not one of them, and I think his likability in this episode really elevates it up. See what I did there? So, I am going to say that this episode is a meh. Despite a bunch of missteps, it's not something I can call bad. It makes for an alright watch, at least the first time you see it. Even if it does leave me longing for something that maybe pushed this concept a little bit further and made it a little bit better. Maybe if the timing of the jokes was just a little bit different, or if the boss character was tweaked a bit, this episode could have been good. But as it stands, I think it's just okay. And if you really like this episode, I can definitely see where you're coming from, especially if you think it's funny. Episode 192A, Company Picnic. Mr. Krabs and Plankton both throw company picnics. Hey, did you guys know that toilet paper has thousands of uses? Well, we already know it can be used to decorate with. Anyway, this episode is... Ah, what's the word? Um... Oh yeah, awful. I actually had trouble coming up with the description for this episode because the conflict doesn't actually kick in until very, very late. We have this whole sequence of SpongeBob with his Patty family, then convincing Krabs to take them on a company picnic, then a scene of them at the company picnic, and then Plankton shows up with his own awesome company picnic, but we don't really know what his plan is yet. And then eventually, he reveals that his plan is 
wait for it, to throw a really good company picnic in order to get Krabs to agree to become a Chum Bucket employee so that the Krabby Patty formula will belong to Plankton. And if that sounds like a pretty awful plan, what's worse is the fact that it inexplicably almost works. But more on that in a minute. So yeah, the actual conflict doesn't kick in until the very end of the episode. At first you kind of think it's going to be like a dueling picnics type thing, but that's not really what the episode is about either because Mr. Krabs jumps ship to Plankton's picnic pretty fast, and until Plankton whips out the contracts, there really is no downside to joining Plankton's picnic. And since Krabs himself ran over to the picnic, SpongeBob's feeble attempt to compete with it seems just kind of pointless. Like, it's not even a contest that Plankton's picnic is a lot better, and especially once Krabs thinks so too, then what's the point? Like, what's at stake here? Nothing. So Spongebob might as well go over and enjoy Plankton's picnic, which he does. So for most of the episode, the stakes are pretty much non-existent. There's not a conflict. It's just the characters going on a really kind of lame company picnic. So back to the stupidity of Krabs willingly wanting to sign this thing that makes him a chum bucket employee. The justification for this is that the picnic is just so good that he's just charmed into doing this, which is really incredible incredibly weak. Like, maybe if Plankton drugged the candy he gave Krabs, which I know it's a kid's show, but I don't know, maybe somehow they could get away with that. Maybe it was like knockout candy or something and Mr. Krabs was getting sleepy so he was kind of hazy and that's why he signs it, or just some other justification other than lol working for Plankton seems like fun, I'm gonna go do it. I mean, I know Krabs' brains are the size of a pencil tip and Mr. Krabs doesn't seem like the brightest bulb at all times, but when it comes to fighting against Plankton, there is no way he would do something this dumb. It's just out of character. It's like the writers forgot to actually have a conflict in the episode or couldn't think of an actual good plan involving Plankton in a company picnic, so they threw this in at the last second. And speaking of out of character, am I the only one that found it weird that Squidward was stuffing his face with cotton candy and peanuts? Sure, Squid's had his freak out moments in the past, but this just seemed like out of the blue. He typically wouldn't stuff his face. That one's not a huge deal, but it did stick out to me a bit. Now let's get on to the other stupid thing about this episode. The ending quote-unquote twist where it turns out that all of Plankton's wonderful things were actually holograms projected onto gross things. Which just makes absolutely no sense. Why are the holograms able to project in a 3D space? Why is it that the characters can't actually taste the disgusting things they're put in their mouth? I understand that the brain can play tricks on you when you genuinely believe you're eating something delicious, but at least SpongeBob should have smelled something. How was the bus able to drive if it was just a broken down boat? How was the robot able to explode if he was just a trash can? Did Plankton program that in for authenticity? And at no point was this like foreshadowed or hinted at in any way. It's once again like the writers threw it in because they knew they had to have some sort of hook or twist at the end of the episode and this was really the best they got. Oh, and the way Spongebob foils Plankton's plot is that he accidentally knocks a pen into the projector, shutting everything off. Basically, the point I'm getting at is that everything about this ending is just stupid and not justified. There are many silly things in Spongebob and silly things are fine, but you have to at least justify it. Give us a good reason why Krabs would sign over to Plankton, not just he enjoyed a picnic foreshadow the fact that these are holograms, or even just give us a better explanation than that. But I guess with a plan this stupid, the only way it could have been foiled was with a stupid random event as well. And as far as the rest of the episode, it's boring because there's no conflict, there's no stakes. And of course it goes without saying, but I don't think there's that many funny jokes in the episode. Okay, sure, I kind of like the slow motion, and I kind of like Krabs struggling to get his shell back on. And there's something kind of endearing about Spongebob role-playing as a Krabby Patty family in the beginning, but everything else in the episode just isn't funny, isn't interesting, isn't much of a story at all, and the only actual plot we get is just stupid. It's a scumbob episode. Did I even really need to say it? Episode 192B. Pull up a barrel. Mr. Krabs tells a tale about his younger days in the Navy. Right off the bat, I have to say that this episode would have been so much better if it had been a 22-minute special. And it's just kind of weird that it's not. Almost any other time that we get an episode that takes place in a different time, Time period, it's a 22 minute special. Ugh, friend or foe, pest of the west, dunces and dragons? 
all specials, which is good because they should be specials, especially if they're going to have wraparound segments like this one does. Because in effect, it's like you only get eight minutes of Krabs' time in the Navy because we have this whole long setup, a few times that it cuts back to SpongeBob, Squidward, and Krabs in present time, and the ending. And of course, this especially sucks because it's in a season in which we get SpongeBob, you're fired, which is a special that very easily could have just been 11 minutes. And unfortunately, because this isn't a special, I do think the story somewhat suffers. For the most part, it does play out rather simply, when it could have been that much more epic and big and complicated. If there's any Spongebob story that deserves it, it's one telling of Krabs' past in the Navy. But alright, enough of my complaining, because despite this sort of thing working better in a longer runtime, I do actually think this is a good episode, even as is. Just the base fact that we get an episode about Krabs in the Navy is something to celebrate, because we've heard about this a number of times over the show, but this is the first time we get to see any of it at length. And it's certainly pretty cool to see a different side of Krabs. One of the creative decisions that I really like about the episode is the choice to make Patrick and Sandy play characters in Krabs' flashback. Sandy plays a surprisingly good pirate captain, and is especially shocking because you expect Plankton to be playing the opposition to Krabs, and Patrick is cast as the irrational, stupid, jerky Navy captain. Do I even really have to say how fitting that is? Well, sure, it would have been perfectly fine to have had new characters in these roles, it is a cool little way to tie in other Spongebob characters and have them playing alternate versions of themselves. Another thing I like about the episode is Krabs' narration, because although what actually happens in the episode is basically straightforward, the way Krabs is narrating, along with the soundtrack, definitely makes it feel bigger and more epic than it actually is. And really, there is nothing wrong with the story, it just comes off as a little bit abridged, when if they had had more time they could have done more things, like have a much more interesting pirate battle and actually explain what happens to Scarfish at the end. Does he die? The last we see of him is being washed away out into the ocean on the sunblock. As far as gags go, it is a little bit light, but I definitely love Spongebob slapping Scarfish's scar off of him and Scarfish yelling, my personality, along with some other minor jokes like crabs saluting in multiple different unusual ways and the weird fascination with moldy bread crust. Oh, and the ending is interesting as well, seeing as we know that Krabs was both in the Navy and a pirate. And the whole time I was watching, I was kind of wondering if they were actually going to address this, and even if they don't directly, they do kind of wink wink nudge nudge at the end like maybe this is how Krabs ended up switching from the Navy to being a pirate. 193A. Sanctuary. Spongebob becomes a crazy cat lady. Also known as the second time that Spongebob would have appeared on Hoarders. Yeah, this episode pretty much follows the exact same pattern of sentimental sponge. Having things slowly grow more and more out of control, showing how it affects affects his life in various ways, and it affects Squidward's life, before officials come in and Spongebob has to do something to get rid of his surplus. And really, a lot of the same problems that I had with that episode, I have with this episode. Mostly in just that not much actually happens in the story. Like, we spend time at the Krusty Krab showing what happens when Spongebob is away, and then Squidward has to leave because of his allergies, but after Squidward leaves, that's the last scene with the Krusty Krab or Mr. Krabs. So that whole plot thread of the Krusty Krab being in trouble ultimately doesn't amount to anything. Sure, it shows how Spongebob's hoarding of these snails is affecting Krabs' business, but it just feels like it's there to fill time. There's also the part where Patrick disguises himself as a snail so he can get into Spongebob's house, which does have a payoff at the end in the form of a joke, but otherwise doesn't really serve any purpose. And I'd be very forgiving if this episode were funny, but it's not. I kind of like Squidward puffing up, especially at the end, and the guy who likes Krabby Patties that Squidward sneezed on was kind of funny, but in general the episode is not. It's also super forgettable and bland, and it really does just make me think of Sentimental Sponge, which wasn't great to begin with. Yeah, I'm gonna say it's a scumbag. I mean, hey, at least Sentimental Sponge had a clever ending. This one just has Bob Barnacle show up and say, hey, look, there's a convenient, easy way to get rid of all of these pets because it turns out that they escaped from my pet rescue place. The whole thing is just kind of a weak story. It's certainly not an awful scumbob, but I really don't see much redeeming here, and it is too similar to Sentimental Sponge in my opinion. And yeah, if it wasn't obvious, that's Bob Barker as Bob Barnacle. Episode 193B, What's Eating Patrick? Mr. Krabs enters 
Patrick in a Krabby Patty eating contest. So this episode is your typical plucky underdog enters and then triumphantly wins a competition. There is something about this story archetype that always does resonate with people. It is always satisfying to see the underdog win out against the champ. Is this episode a good parody of the cliches found in this type of story? Well, it's an all right one. We do have the adorable little kid who desperately wants his hero to win, and a lot of the gags surrounding him are pretty funny, like Patrick spitting in his face, the fact that he can't pronounce words correctly because he's so adorable, and how Patrick accidentally breaks his other leg at the end of the episode. Additionally, they made the antagonist fish actually not be a jerk. Typically, and especially in like the 80s and 90s sports movie version of this cliche, the champion is a complete jerk to the protagonist. And the reason this is usually done is so that there's personal stakes and so that you really, really, really want to root for the underdog, not just to win, but to beat those mean old good players. But in this episode, the guy doesn't even get much screen time, and when he does, he just kind of has polite conversation with Patrick. Sure, maybe he is a jerk on his own time. To be fair, I'm not quite sure what fish comes to a town that he doesn't live in and enters in their contest on their Founders Day, but hey, maybe eating contests are all this guy has. Anyway, point is, it was kind of refreshing to see him not be a jerk. But aside from all of that, I wouldn't say the episode really makes fun of this type of story that much. You know Spongebob could do a much better job at satirizing this material, and in fact has done so in the past. But it does still do an okay job at that, and there are a few other laughs in the episode not related, like the file photo of Patrick using a chair incorrectly, or the rival fish flushing down the Krabby Patties like he's a toilet. Not amazingly laugh out loud worthy jokes, but still kind of funny. And the climax of the episode, the actual eating contest, is pretty great. Season 9b, so far at least, has been really good at building up atmosphere through the amazing use of soundtrack, and much like in Pull Up a Barrel, they use a narrator to get you more hyped up about what's going on, not to mention the excitement of the crowd and all of the Patrick paraphernalia that's being thrown around. You definitely can't help but get swept up in the excitement and really want Patrick to win. And when it comes to this type of episode, that is so very important. If you don't want the guy to win, then you don't care about what's happening. My main complaint, though, is that this episode makes a jerk out of crabs for no real reason. The antagonist of the episode is this rival eating competition guy. Even though he's not jerky, he is still the antagonist in the force that Patrick is working against. And besides just wanting to beat his competition, there are many other motivations in this episode, like Patrick's want to taste that last Krabby Patty, and the fact that it is Founder's Day and it would be a huge letdown to see the underdog from Bikini Bottom lose. So I don't understand why they need to make crabs into such a crusty jerk that forces Patrick Patrick to go on with the eating contest, and in a really mean way too. He never receives any comeuppance, and if anything, his business is thriving because of the stuff he did. Mr. Krabs could have had a really sweet mentor relationship with Patrick, but instead, Krabs just has to act like a jerk here. I'm totally fine with him acting like a jerk in episodes where he is the antagonist, or he does get comeuppance for his actions, but here it's just not necessary. You can still have him be motivated by money in the Krusty Krab, but you could have him be a little bit nicer to the guy who's making this competition possible. It doesn't serve a point, and it does kind of tarnish what is ultimately a very sweet episode in every other aspect. But all that aside, I think it is a good episode. It certainly could have been a lot better in a few different ways, but as it stands, it's a little bit funny and very satisfying to watch. 194A, Patrick, the game. Patrick invents his own board game. I guess this would be the kid's version of Charty McDennis. Anyway, this episode is meh for a very simple reason. There's no stakes in this episode. What happens if Patrick's game sucks? Nothing. What happens if Patrick's game is great? Nothing. It's not like Patrick and Squidward made any sort of bet. Patrick just said, I can do this, and Squidward's like, yeah, okay. And it's not like they're forcing Squidward to play the game. Sure, they kind of coerce him into staying a few times, but he does keep coming back. And it's not like there's even anything up for grabs for whoever wins the game. It's just watching these characters play a kind of silly game with no rules. Yeah, this episode isn't very funny. Sure, some of Squidward's one-liners are all right, but that's about it. At the same time, though, it is a pleasant episode. There's nothing frustrating about it, the characters are all fine, and it's not so boring that it deserves a scumbob, but it's just not very interesting. If you're the type of person who just likes hanging out in the world of Spongebob and doesn't mind that a story doesn't actually have that much going on, then yeah, I could definitely see you giving this a good. But as for me, I expect a little more in the story or comedy department. 
sense. And I have this crazy feeling that if this episode were made in season two or three, Squidward would end up really loving the game and get too far into it, demanding everyone else plays it his way, a la Snowball Effect or Idiot Box. And I think that would lead to a lot more conflict and comedy. Oh, and speaking of what ifs, I like that they have this game called Certified Public Accountant at the beginning, but they don't actually really make too many jokes about it. They just kind of say, well, this is a thing that exists. They definitely could have gotten a lot funnier with that setup. There is one thing, though, that I really do like about this episode, the montage of Patrick creating the game. It's not anything funny, but once again, it has good atmosphere, thanks in part to the music, as well as some of the lighting and just the way the sequence is put together. It's fun and triumphant, but yeah, overall a pretty forgettable episode. Episode 194B, The Sewers of Bikini Bottom. SpongeBob and Squidward must enter the sewers to retrieve the formula. Man, bad things always happen when Squidward is put in charge at the Krusty Krab. Something kind of unique about this episode is that it has a secondary plot that stars a character that's only in this episode, Charlton Hawkfish, played by Jeff Bennett, who is not a name that I recognize, but he's been in a lot of animated projects over the years, like voicing Johnny Bravo, just to name one. And I actually really like this character and the subplot. How he's overly dramatic about everything is not only funny because it's in a Spongebob cartoon, but also because he's talking about sewer pipes, something incredibly mundane. But at the same time, even though he's being overly dramatic, he is still right about everything and incredibly competent in the end. It takes a really well-written and likable character to pull off just throwing this one-off character as the protagonist of his own side story in an episode. But I think they really did pull it off. And I also really like the main story with Spongebob and Squidward. Them randomly flushing stuff down the toilet in a shared manic episode is classic Spongebob. And the gags really just keep coming. From not wanting to flush down old man Jenkins, to telling everyone in the Krusty Krab that the fry cook is in the toilet, to all the rapid fire gags about trying to get the safe back. There's just a lot of gags in this episode and I really do appreciate that. Because I think that is something that has been missing from the post first movie episodes in a big way. The episode also shows off a new location the sewers, and it really does take advantage of the fact that they're in HD now with some really great looking backgrounds. Another rare thing about this episode is the fact that it is about getting back the Krabby Patty formula, but it actually has nothing at all all to do with Plankton. I really kind of expected them to shoehorn him in at some point, but no, they never do. And that's good because he doesn't need to be in every episode with the formula. The formula can just be a MacGuffin that needs to be retrieved. And in fact, the formula bottle is never even seen in the episode. And it really is refreshing to see them using the Krabby Patty secret formula in a different way. It's a good episode. In fact, it's a really good episode with a new location, a one-off character that really leaves an impression, lots of comedy, and a refreshing story. Kind of funny that this is an episode where SpongeBob is literally covered in scum. Episode 195A, SpongeBob Long Pants. SpongeBob gets new pants that completely change his life. I think this is actually a pretty clever episode in a very subtle way. Basically, it's SpongeBob rebooted. New job, new friends, new name, and a boating license. Not to mention the new pants. And this isn't me grasping at an interpretation here. The very first thing in the episode is SpongeBob talking about a Murray Man and Barnacle Boy reboot. Unfortunately though, for how clever and subtle that whole part of the episode is, this one has some problems. To start, we already had an episode that was kicked off with SpongeBob getting a new pair of legwear. And sure, the episodes go in very different directions, but there was no real reason to have have it be this way. In fact, I think it would have been much better if SpongeBob got a new pair of dress shoes to better fit with the reboot theme and to just differentiate it from SpongeBob round pants. But the much bigger issue is that this episode is super rushed. This is the kind of story that works much better in a 22 minute episode. And again, I must remind everyone, this is in the season that we got SpongeBob You're Fired. It really is frustrating considering that this episode is actually really similar to SpongeBob you're fired in terms of basic premise of Spongebob's life changing after he leaves his job. It's just that that one couldn't figure out exactly what it wanted to do for the story and this one just tried to shove every single thing in there. The problem here is that we don't get that much time to spend on Spongebob's new job. It's in one scene. Spongebob's new friends only get a few lines. And heck, we never even get to see Spongebob drive on his own, despite having a license. I definitely think this would have been a good episode had it been a 22 minute special, but as it is, Unfortunately, it's just meh. 
Another problem is that the episode would have been much better off if they had better emphasized why pants are a sign of adulthood. I mean, it does kind of make sense, because most business attire is long pants, and shirts are seen as much more casual, but it's not like it's a universal sign of adulthood like having a mustache is. So if they were going to use something that is only kind of sort of related to adulthood, they really should have spent time selling us on why these represent adulthood, at least in the show. I'm fine with it being ridiculous that the movie theater doesn't allow people in long pants. But only if you sell us on this idea that pants are somehow this universal symbol of adulthood. And lastly, there's the ending. Spongebob suddenly can't get out of these pants because the zipper is stuck. This is actually kind of clever as well, considering the guy at the beginning definitely seemed like a con man, and Spongebob has the pretty funny line of, now I know I'm an adult because I've been ripped off. But the issue is that it's over too quickly. He's stuck in the pants for a few seconds, then Krabs comes out and cuts them off. If this were a 22 minute special and he gets stuck in the pants too thirds of the way through and is forced to continue living this life he doesn't want, then the story would be a lot better. But as it stands, it's just one really quick conflict that they just threw in at the end that doesn't have any time to play out. Aside from the cleverness, I do like things like Mrs. Puff somehow knowing that Spongebob has gotten his license and the Krusty Krab customers all eating like big fat slobs. But the little jokes like those in no way make up for this episode's massive pacing problems. Oh, and for some reason, Jeff Bennett is also in this episode as a guest star. It's kind of unusual to have the same guest star for two episodes that aren't connected at all, but I mean, hey, it's not a bad thing. Episode 195B, Larry's Gym. Larry finds that operating his gym comes at the cost of his own fitness. Wow, I never thought I'd see an episode with Larry the Lobster as a protagonist. Sure, there have been other episodes that have Larry play a part in, like Sponge Guard on Duty or A Life in a Day, but even in those episodes, Larry doesn't play too much of a part and he is definitely not the protagonist. It's so refreshing and and nice to have a character who isn't Spongebob, Krabs, Plankton, or Patrick be the protagonist. If nothing else but for variety's sake. And although Spongebob does play a big part, it is undoubtedly Larry's story. And Larry here is a very likable protagonist. You understand what his problems are, and you're rooting for him to find a way to solve them. I'm very glad they went with the kinder, more sympathetic side of Larry than the jerkbag Larry that features in some episodes. When you boil it down, the story itself is very predictable and basic. Basic. Larry opens a gym because he wants to work out more, but he can't because he's too busy operating the gym. Predictably, the solution is to just stop operating the gym and just go back to working out. Similarly, SpongeBob mysteriously is able to get ripped while he's also chugging a bunch of water. Surprise of all surprises, it's because he's over engorged himself on it. But it's fine, because although the story is just kind of predictable and simple, it is an entertaining journey along the way. There's a lot of gags in this episode that I like. SpongeBob's nose having a muscle, the shot of the bikini bottomites all being super fat, Larry's literal pot belly, and the Mr. Krabs being cheap jokes I actually really enjoy here. Mostly for the fact that Krabs actually plays pretty much no part in the actual story itself, so it's perfectly acceptable for him to just be comic relief playing up his one character trait. It works so much better here because his cheapness isn't getting in the way of anything and is just used for jokes. I especially love him just appearing out of the ether as soon as the word free is mentioned and drinking Larry's disgusting tear juice. Although I have to say the ending gag is so predictable. But in general, it's a pretty funny episode and a satisfying story. It's definitely a good episode. Oh, and there's also a guy who screams my legs when his legs get crushed. I wasn't entirely sure if I should include this, but eh. The two broken legs are there so you know it's a different version of the my leg gag. I just can't get over the fact that after so many seasons, they actually had a different character be the protagonist for once. I mean, what next? Are they going to give Pearl an episode all to herself with SpongeBob only getting one line in at the end? Ah, yeah, right. 196A, The Fishbowl. Sandy secretly runs pranks on Spongebob and Patrick. I mean, social experiments. What I appreciate about this episode is that it does genuinely teach some behavioral psychology. Give someone a bigger bowl and their food will appear smaller. Make someone think that someone else is getting more than them and they will get jealous and want a sense of justice. People do act differently when they think they're being recorded. It even gives a clear definition of what behavior psychology is, in that it is the study of people and their habits. Even Sandy's ice cream chuck is a reference 
reference to a famous psychologist, Ivan Pavlov, and his well-known Pavlov's dog study. So I think the basic idea here is really good and that they were onto something, but this episode is boring. There's actually a sequence where we watch SpongeBob and Patrick count sand. And even though Sandy is somehow surprised at SpongeBob and Patrick's behavior, all of it is very predictable. Oh gee, Patrick acts like a jerk when he gets put in a place of power. I've never seen that before. To be fair though, at least Patrick's jerkiness here is a part of the story and he does get called out and apologize for it, even though in the end he doesn't actually think he did anything wrong and that it's science's fault. Despite the interesting premise, it's just so forgettable. And each individual bit just kind of goes on and on. Also, I did not like the whole Squidward part of this episode. Like, it could have been clever if Sandy was also observing him and everything she was doing was also to get a reaction out of him, but outside of that ending gag, that's not the case, and it just kind of seems like Sandy's being a jerk to Squidward for no reason whatsoever. And I don't know, desperately running out to chase the ice cream truck feels kind of beneath Squidward. It's not an abysmal episode, but I think it is boring enough to be considered a scumbob episode. I really wanted to like this episode, but the execution just leaves a lot to be desired. I did like the joke about Spongebob and Patrick being camera shy, though. Episode 196B, Married to Money. Plankton disguises himself as money and marries Mr. Krabs in another attempt to learn the formula. Oh boy, this episode. I do like Pearl here because she does act like an actual teenage daughter would act in regards to her father having a new love interest. It's a nice little touch of realism, plus some of the jokes around her makeup being a rat and her boots actually being barnacles are kind of funny. That said, the rest of the episode isn't funny, but it actually kind of goes beyond not being funny in the fact that it's a bummer. The ending of this episode is just sad. There isn't the slightest bit of positivity or optimism thrown in there. It is just, well, Krabs, you fell in love with and married Plankton accidentally, and you're probably gonna be alone forever. And you had to tip your waiter. In fact, this is probably the saddest ending in all of SpongeBob. And while I think sad endings in general are perfectly fine, it really does not fit this show. Because it's not even one of those things that's like sad, but is supposed to be fun like Squidward getting left with all those monsters in the thing. No, aside from the waiter joke, it's all played pretty straight. At the same time though, while it's a bummer that Krabs ends up alone and sad here, I also don't really feel bad for him. Because think about it, in this entire episode, does he like anything, anything at all about Kashina, except for the fact that she is literally made of money? That's pretty shallow. But the biggest issue with the ending is that it just fades out. It doesn't have like one big sad punch at the end. It doesn't have any bit of optimism for Krabs at the end. It doesn't have a lesson that Krabs is supposed to learn, like about falling in love for reasons other than money. It just ends. And that's why I consider it a bummer because it's not even like it's played up for drama or a tragic ending. It's just a downer for no reason. The episode is also obvious because they show us at the beginning that it's Plankton in disguise. It would be one thing if they left it ambiguous, like they strongly hinted it was Plankton and Krabs would suspect it being Plankton, but surprise plot twist it actually isn't Plankton. But no, they just point blank show us that it is Plankton from the very start and no duh, his plan is going to fail. As a romance episode, it's a complete sham where one half is shallow and the other half is literally scheming. As a comedy, it's just not very funny. And as a story, it has a very unsatisfying ending. Don't be fooled by the cutesy little music they play or the cool design of Kashina. It's a scumbob episode. I mean, a good portion of the jokes in the episode are either Plankton or Krabs getting electrocuted. And the whole SpongeBob setting up the party on the cheap has already been done in Truth or Square, right down to the fact that they're decorating with toilet paper. There are so many better ways they could have done this concept. Maybe Kashina is someone that Plankton hires to get the formula from Krabs, but she ends up falling in love with him. Or what if Kashina was piloted by Karen at Plankton's insistence, but then Plankton ruins the whole thing when Karen seems to maybe be getting a little bit too into it. Or heck, how about just an episode where Plankton rubs in the fact that he actually has a wife? Despite it being a computer wife, it is still the the one thing that Plankton has and Krabs does not. I could sit here all day doing this, but it doesn't change the fact that this episode as it is, is not very good. But hey, it was nice to see Mrs. Puff at Krabs' wedding, for whatever that's worth. 
Episode 197A, Mall Girl Pearl. Pearl gets a job that is totally not Coral. All right, before we talk anything about the story or the fact that it stars Pearl or anything like that, we have to talk about the crazy amount of detail they put into the background of this episode. So first off, walking through the mall, there are tons of cameos. From a blink and you miss it appearance of Bubble Buddy and the didgeridoo player from Something Smells, to the more obvious ones like Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy and Squidward and SpongeBob. There's so many other characters in the background that are one-offs that I can't even list them all here. But that's not even where it ends. The stores in the background all have these unique and creative names, and the floor that Pearl is working on is all worn down and gross. There's even graffiti that says the same things as the graffiti in Sailor Mouth. And on top of all of that, there's little signs on some of the stores that have a no Mr. Krabs symbol. Typically, continuity nods and little background stuff like that don't actually affect the quality of the episode that much, but when they go this far overboard with the amazing attention into detail, it absolutely makes the episode worth watching. But that's not even the only unique thing about the episode. It is entirely from Pearl's perspective, even more so than Larry's gym was about Larry. This episode, SpongeBob only gets a singular line at the very end, as well as some cameos in the background. And the only previously established character that actually plays a part in the story at all is Mr. Krabs, and he only gets about three or four lines. And it works! Is it unusual that the episode is from Pearl's perspective? Sure, but not once did I feel like, man, I really wish SpongeBob was more in this episode. Like I said with Larry's Gym, it is just refreshing to get to see other characters on this show take the spotlight. As long as there aren't tons of episodes like this, doing these every so often is a very good thing. And of course, this is also helped by the fact that the second main character in the episode is played by Betty White, who is just an amazing actress and does a great job of bringing that warm, grandma-ish touch to the episode. And of course, because this is an elderly person on Spongebob, she is also incredibly awesome at kicking butt, and the climax of the episode is very satisfying. Additionally, there's Pearl's friends. Pearl seems to have different friends in pretty much every episode, but the one constant is that they're always awful towards her. But hey, that's teenagers for you. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's sad. I should also note that one of them is played by Aubrey Plaza, but I don't actually know who that is, so I did put it on the fun fact there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you ensure you're gonna get a few extra hundred comments on your video of people telling me who Aubrey Plaza is. Anyway, Pearl's friends are fun as well because they each kind of represent different teen stereotypes. As for the story, it's nothing complex or crazy, but it doesn't need to be. It's a simple story of Pearl's first job at the mall and how she learns to appreciate a demographic that's ordinarily seen as not Coral, and the unlikely friendship that forms between Pearl and Beatrice. And I like the jokes in the episode, like the one about who took the picture of the guy who's taking pictures, or the fact that the mall has a basement floor that is apparently just filled with crime. Not a phenomenally funny episode, but still, good jokes nonetheless. Of course, it's a good episode. An interesting new perspective, a solid story, a wonderful guest star, an amazing attention to detail with the backgrounds, and some good jokes. It's a very unique and enjoyable episode. Episode 197B, Two Thumbs Down. SpongeBob breaks his thumbs after over-gesturing with them. So I do like the song in this episode, as well as the climax where Spongebob and Patrick do a thumb war, as it is not only a nice way to show that Spongebob has regained control of his thumbs, but also makes the episode come full circle, as that's what he and Patrick were doing at the very start. But aside from those two things, which are good, but not really great, this episode is pretty easily Meh. The story is basically a day without tears or funny pants all over again. Spongebob overuses something, then Spongebob can't use something. It's just that simple, and unfortunately the episode isn't really funny. I could forgive this premise being one that they've done before if it was, but it's really not. The episode's trying to also do some sort of parody of like an injured sports star or something, but they don't actually really make fun of these tropes too much. They just have Spongebob be overly dramatic, and then there's the big montage, and then everyone's happy at the end when Spongebob can use his thumbs again. It just feels so boring. Like, they're just going through the motions here. There's nothing bad about this episode, but there really isn't much good either. Certainly not enough to justify it being called good. Like, the thumb war was alright, but not really good or anything, and the same goes for the song itself. It's a nice song, but it can't lay a finger on some of the best Spongebob songs out there. So, overall, I give this episode two thumbs to the side, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately I went with the one rating that doesn't really work as a pun with the title of the episode. But, speaking of thumb gestures... hey, Sharks vs. Pods. 
SpongeBob finds himself mixed up in a gang war. So this episode guest stars Henry Winkler, Michael McKean, and David Lander as the Sharks. I'm not entirely sure why there's four Sharks, but only three guest voices, but, uh... Yeah, all of these three were on Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. Henry Winkler, of course, being the Fonz. And I could have sworn I'd heard the name Michael McKean somewhere recently, and as it turns out, he's Chuck on Better Call Saul. Dude's a really good actor. Anyway, this is an episode that is 100% style over substance. The story is pretty weak. It's just a series of misunderstandings that are cleared up at the end, and it turns out that this gang was actually just a dance crew. Because apparently the show is no longer allowed to have actually legitimately threatening characters. Every time there's a tough guy or a scary guy or whatever, it has to be a mislead. Just ask the mild ones and the guy in the alley who just wanted to return Squidward's groceries. And of course, Cousin Blackjack. I don't know, maybe I'll make a square theory on this sometime. Point being, the story itself is not very good. But here's the thing. When it comes to Spongebob, at least, sometimes style actually is better than substance. Because despite the weak and kind of predictable story, the episode is a lot of fun. The music and all of the greaser atmosphere, the little finger snaps, the shark's accents, all the fun dancing at the end, seeing Spongebob trying to act tough, it's all very enjoyable. Spongebob has never needed to have a good story as long as it had some Something going for it. Though the episode isn't particularly funny, there are still some good jokes in there, like the sharks overreacting about Donnie, and the great gag at the end where Patrick runs in saying that they saved the rec center that's never been mentioned before just because it's a cliche. But really, the focus on the episode is just all of this fun, West Side Story, Grease, Happy Days-esque atmosphere, thanks in part to the wonderful music direction of the episode. And hey, here I am again saying the atmosphere is good. If there's one thing that Season 9B does really well, it is getting the atmosphere right. And though it might not seem it, that is something that is very important. The right atmosphere can make an episode and the wrong one can break it. What else do I need to say? Hey yo, it's a good episode. And of course I have to mention that the hydrodynamic spatula from the very first episode actually makes an appearance in a photo in SpongeBob's house. Not to mention the fact that Reg gets another cameo and the pods dance kind of similarly to how Squidward did in Culture Shock. Episode 198B, Dipper makes clones of himself to impress when do Oh, <laughs> oops. Copy Bob Ditto Pants. Plankton makes SpongeBob clones to infiltrate the Krusty Krab. This episode sounds like an interesting idea, but it's one that is actually kind of boring and repetitive. Plankton keeps sending Sponge clones in and the same thing happens every time. SpongeBob talks to them so they won't tell him the formula. Then he sends in a bunch of these clones and then every time he tries to ask them for the formula, they wither away. SpongeBob in this episode is really ignorant, stupid variety of SpongeBob that thinks all of these copies are just strangers that kind of resemble him, except he also is just cool with them all working the grill and working at the Krusty Krab, and Krabs is just okay with telling this legion of Spongebobs the secret formula, which is totally not suspicious at all. But I guess they didn't want the episode to be Plankton disguises himself as Spongebob in order to get the formula, because we've already had that a bunch. In terms of the comedy, it's definitely very light. In fact, I think all of the jokes that I actually enjoyed were from Squidward's subplot of thinking that he's dreaming. That one fish being the man of squid's dreams, Squidward's I don't care dance out of the Krusty Krab, pulling down Krabs' pants and bumping him back into his office. Yeah, these are all alright gags, but in terms of the main story, you know, the bulk of the episode, no, none of it really is funny. In terms of the episode as a whole, I don't think it's really bad enough to be a scumbob, but it's still on the lower side of Meh. The episode is still a little bit interesting, and Squidward's subplot is decently entertaining, so this one does kinda scrape by. It's inoffensive, just kinda dull. Also, fun fact, Spongebob was previously cloned at the end of Overbooked. Episode 199A, Sold. Squidward tricks Patrick and Spongebob into thinking people have moved into their houses. This episode really feels classic. Like, it's a classic early Spongebob move for Squidward to tell Spongebob and Patrick that people have moved into their houses, and then having to pretend to be those new people in order to keep up the ruse. It's an old school farce, and I love it. My favorite part, of course, is Squidward's really gratuitous German-ish speak. 
as well as just seeing the guy run back and forth and back and forth. It's a good episode. It's definitely one of the funnier ones this season, and it's just a story that works for Spongebob. It's also cool seeing Spongebob and Patrick's little garbage house, and there's other funny little lines like Patrick saying that he needs to learn how to learn. The ending is a bit predictable, but it's still okay. And the beginning of the episode definitely reminded me of That's No Lady, when the guy on the street convinced Patrick to get out of town just because he was trying to sell him something. Not that that's really a complaint. I don't actually have that much to say, but sometimes with a good episode, that's just the way it is. There's not much to talk about because a lot of it is just good humor that doesn't really need to be dissected. It's just got that really good Squidward and Spongebob and Patrick dynamic that is really sorely missing from the later seasons of the show. And I think we have season six to blame for that, after screwing up the formula pretty badly. But none of that is present here. Squidward does a bad thing in continuing to mislead Spongebob and Patrick and pays the price for it, though not in an overly cruel way. And Spongebob and Patrick remain ignorant and good-hearted throughout, with the one bad thing they do to Squidward being a complete misunderstanding. Episode 199B, Lame and Fortune. When Spongebob finds fortune cookies that always come true, Plankton makes his own to trick crabs. I know this is gonna sound a little nitpicky, but I was kinda bothered by the fact that these fortune cookies were tiny compared to Spongebob and crabs. Sure, they've kinda played fast and loose with exactly how small the undersea life is compared to the humans, but the one constant is that they are always small, as shown in episodes like Frankendoodle and both movies. So why exactly were these cookies so small? It really doesn't matter matter that much, but I do feel that they could have done a better job of setting up these fortune cookies other than just having them literally fall out of the sky. My favorite part of the episode was indeed the climax where Plankton was trying to get the formula bottle from Spongebob, but there's just a sea of chum bucket customers that is making it unable for him to do so. It's a really fun sequence and for the most part it's well animated, despite the fact that there is a really egregious fish that doesn't have a mouth towards the end of it. Anyway, it's a really fun sequence. My main complaint though is the fact that it really doesn't have much of anything to do with the rest of the episode. If the focus of your episode is fortune cookies, then you would think that Plankton gets foiled by the same fortune cookies. Maybe instead of a sea of fish, it's a sea of cookies that prevents him from getting to the bottle. Or maybe he doesn't believe that they all come true and he opens a bunch of them himself because he's a cocky man of science and they all have bad things on them that come true. Something like that. The climax we got is definitely cool and I like it, but I think it would have fit better in a different episode. So yeah, I definitely would have tweaked the episode in the setup and the climax, but I do have to say that it is a particularly funny episode. Squidward saying his depression is award-winning, which is, I guess, technically true. I'm sure in all of its time on air, Spongebob's won at least a few awards. Although maybe not if they nominate things like Dear Vikings and that sinking feeling. Where was I? Oh, right, funny things. There's Krabs firing his body at Squidward to tackle him out of the cashier's spot. Karen making a crack at how her marriage is hollow and empty. Plankton crashing from his little helicopter thing. It's not like a jaw-dropping, hilarious episode, but the laughs are relatively consistent in here. And the story itself is fine. Yeah, the fortune cookies maybe could have been set up a little bit better, but the story of them being inexplicably true all the time and then Plankton using that to his advantage is certainly interesting. And though the climax may not have fit thematically, it was still a lot of fun. All in all, it's a good episode. Without the comedy, this might have slipped into meh territory, but with it, it certainly does not. I also found it cool that they snuck in Grandpappy the Pirate and a few other cameos into Krabs' morbid fantasy. I would also like to make a note of how Plankton basically convinces Krabs that he's gonna die if he doesn't hand over the formula, which on the surface sounds as bad as what Krabs did to Plankton in one course meal, but because of the execution here, it is played off a lot more lightheartedly. I just want to mention that because this serves as a good contrast, and it does show that tone definitely matters. And it isn't about what's literally happening so much as it is how the characters, and even the show itself, treats the situation. And I do love how blatant Plankton's fortune is. A lot of times in cartoons they'll go with the, you will be destroyed, or you will face your untimely demise, or something like that. But no, it just flat out states, you will die. Hmm, I wonder if this episode led to any creepypastas. Oh, and yet again we have this weird variant on the my leg gag, with the plural, my legs. Episode 200, Goodbye Krabby Patty? Yikes, Nickelodeon really needs to stop with making every special have a clickbaity title. When frozen Krabby Patties become wildly successful, Spongebob loses his job, 
and his best friend. So the story of this episode is basically just a longer, more complicated version of selling out. But I think this episode has a lot more going on with it and is different enough that I don't really mind that they are kind of similar stories. There's a certain irony to this episode in the fact that the characters talk about filler, obviously referring to an ingredient they add into the Krabby Patties, but it's interesting because that's one of, if not the biggest issue with a lot of the bad Spongebob specials, that they have too much filler, that the writers don't know how to make a 22 minute episode because they're so used to making stories that only take up half that time. And the irony here being the fact that this episode has exactly no filler in it at all. Every scene, every part of the episode is important to the overall story. Even things that aren't strictly necessary for the plot are still important for at least thematic reasons, like when Plankton comes and tries to steal the formula. Yeah, yeah, sure, that scene could have been cut, but it does serve the purpose of showing that everything in SpongeBob's life has been thrown completely out of whack thanks to this one change. I think one really good creative decision that they made was to have the Patrick and SpongeBob friendship be the emotional core of the episode. Sure, you could have told this exact same story without Patrick being in it, have it be more about SpongeBob missing the Krabby Patty and his old job, but not only have we already had a few episodes that already tackled that, like Krusty Dogs, but in inserting this emotional core of the friendship between Spongebob and Patrick being torn apart not only helps them fill up the appropriate amount of time, but makes the story a much more personal one. While yes, we care about Spongebob getting his beloved Krabby Patty back, his friendship with Patrick is even more important than that. And much like with Plankton, including Patrick in the story, again shows that Spongebob's life is being ruined in more ways than one. And the Spongebob and Patrick story, while simple, is still effective. Patrick is 110% likable and sympathetic here, and they do a great job of setting up the friendship very early on with a montage of the two having fun. Not only that, but they include symbolism, like their choice of ice cream to show that Patrick is being forced to live a life that he doesn't want instead of the simple one with Spongebob. One thing I would have changed about Patrick's part in the story was to show more about why Patrick couldn't just quit this lifestyle. Maybe he wanted to be a star at first and now he's just locked into the contracts. Maybe Krabs is bullying him into it. Maybe he's just scared to say no. It's not that important because the episode does get across the idea that for whatever reason Patrick can't just quit what he's doing, but I think a short scene that kind of spells it out more explicitly would have made the story even better. Then of course there is John Hamm's character Don Grouper. Now of course this is all a big reference to Mad Men where Hamm played a similar ad exec there. And they did a great job with this character. Hamm delivers a really spectacular performance. You wouldn't know that he's not typically a voice actor. But his voice is perfect for it. He's so suave and smooth talking. This is what an executive and a boss character should be like. Yeah looking at you executive treat. I also like that Don isn't really the villain of the piece. Sure, he is the one that's goading crabs into putting filler into the patties, I guess he's ignoring health regulations, and he is definitely using Patrick, but he's not really played up to be a villain, and in fact faces no consequences at the end. While it's always nice to have a villain, sometimes it is more interesting to live in a more grey area. As far as humor goes, well, do you like seeing characters having overinflated butts? Because there's a lot of that. I could definitely see people being grossed out by that and other people finding it really funny, but I think I fall in the middle ground because I don't think it's either. The jokes about Patrick being a star are pretty good. Don says that he's gonna make Patrick into a star and Patrick nonchalantly says that he already is one. And then Patrick mentions something about wanting to be with his friends and then the exec lady says that stars don't need friends. There are jokes in here, but you kinda have to squint to look for them. Aside from the obvious butt jokes and characters spitting up sand. But, eh, but. Really, the focus is on the storytelling, and it is leaps and bounds ahead of Spongebob You're Fired. Because it's a very clear story with very clear stakes, and Krabs actually has a much better motivation here. It's still not great though. Of course, there could be a lot more jokes, and there are some storytelling bits and pieces that just could have been done better. And they don't really elaborate on a lot of the details, like could Krabs still sell the frozen Krabby Patties, but with less or no filler? Or would he be operating at a loss to do so? And does he lose all his his money at the end, and if so, why? He got paid a ridiculously enormous amount of money, and it's not ever mentioned that he loses it, but he acts as if he's lost everything at the end. 
These things definitely don't prevent the episode from being a good episode, but a little bit more detail and nuance to the story could have escalated it into a really good episode. As it stands, it is an enjoyable and satisfying story with a good emotional core. At first, I was wondering why Patrick's commercial was the 400th commercial instead of something more meaningful like 500th or 1000th or something like that, and then I remembered this is the 200th produced episode of this show. And with most episodes containing two segments, this falls somewhere around the 400th story overall. Give or take some specials, some season 5 shorts, and two TV movies. 201A. Sandy's Nutmare. Sandy forces her tree to make a surplus of nuts to feed Bikini Bottom. This is just a solid story. It slowly eases you into the conflict by first showing Sandy's tree is weakened and then having Sandy try to strengthen it with science, which leads to it overproducing, which leads to Sandy having to figure out how to get rid of it all. Then through some shenanigans with Patrick, the Bikini Bottomites all love the nutty butter she makes from it, which causes her to force her tree to overproduce. And then a shaman that SpongeBob meets along the way teaches a lesson about how it's bad to to ask more from nature than she's able to provide. When you get right down to it, it's basically Jellyfish Hunter, except no one is really the bad guy. She does ask too much of her tree, but easily recants as soon as she realizes her mistake. And it also helps that her motivation is that she wants to give away food that the Bikini Bottomites all love, instead of doing something selfish like making money off of it. It's not really mentioned in the episode, but a running theme in the show is that Sandy is kind of an outsider in Bikini Bottom. So it makes sense why she'd want to do something that contributes to the community and makes them like her a lot more. But what turns this from a good story into a really good episode is the shaman character and everything about him. He's played by Eric Bauza, I think it's pronounced, who plays a lot of bit parts in animation and hasn't been in really much that I recognize. What startled me though is the fact that he's not an old man. He plays the cranky old guy character so well in this episode that I genuinely thought that he was one of those old sitcom granddads that's always cranky. But no, he's only 37. Anyway, back to the character, I like everything about him, from his jellyfish hat looking thing, to the fact that he's a shaman salmon, plus the fact that he's grumpy but also really nice at the same time. And the jokes surrounding him are great, like Spongebob looking at his armpit hair and thinking that that's his garden, and the fact that Spongebob, Patrick, and Sandy fell asleep at him telling the story. Oh, and the story itself is my favorite part of the episode. Not only does it have a really interesting art style and teach an important lesson, but it also features a great use of Squidward as a pure butt monkey. What's great is that Squid isn't even in the episode otherwise, but he's only in this story so that Patrick can annoy him. And there's also the moon pun. It's a real highlight of the episode because it's funny, looks great, and helps impart the moral lesson of the episode. And speaking of the moral here, I actually really like what the shaman says. Because in a lot of episodes of Spongebob, they take the stance that mass production and industry is bad because of pollution and corruption and destroying nature, etc, etc. Which is not entirely untrue, and of course is an important thing to teach kids, but those other episodes never actually really talk about alternatives. It's basically just, industry is bad, let's stop it. But in this one, the shaman doesn't tell Sandy to stop what she's doing, but instead tells her that she can produce this much nutty butter, but she should use a bunch of trees instead of overworking one. Which is a fair compromise that helps out nature and allows the benefits of industry to continue onwards. Anyway, it's a really good episode with an interesting new character, a good good moral, a well-told story, and some good laughs. Episode 201B, Bulletin Board. An anonymous user causes trouble on the Krusty Krab's new bulletin board. Now, if you were to tell me that there's an episode of SpongeBob that is one great big metaphor for posting online anonymously, I would tell you that sounds like the absolute worst idea for an episode ever, and that there is no way the show could do it without being cringy or making it feel out of place for the technology that the show usually presents, or making it be really preachy in terms of being pro-censorship or something. But I kid you not, this episode is brilliant. I love it. I really do. I think what's great is that instead of making it actually about characters posting on the internet, they make it about a literal board that the characters are posting anonymous notes to. 
Another clever thing is the fact that they brought back Bubble Bass here in a way that actually makes sense for his character. Yeah, he's had bit parts in episodes like Plankton's Good Eye and Goodbye Krabby Patty, but this is the first time since season one that he's actually done something antagonistic and more in line with his original characterization. And having him be an obnoxious guy posting mean comments is an amazing way to include him in the story, even if he doesn't actually do that much in the grand scheme of things. But I think what I love best about this episode is that it really doesn't take a side in terms of censorship versus free reign anonymous posting. Instead, it just kind of presents all of the good and bad that anonymity and freedom of speech can bring. Some people are going to use it to be jerks, some people are going to use it to be kind, some people are going to use it to further their own selfish needs like crabs, and when it comes to inflammatory posts, some people are going to think they're funny, some people are going to think they're mean, and some like Spongebob are going to seriously take it to heart and have it affect them in a negative way. And I also like the fact that all Ultimately, it is all a big misunderstanding by Patrick, because that happens on the internet too. People sometimes assume the worst from a comment that really was meant with good intentions. And it just kind of highlights some of the struggles that come with communicating on a grand scale. At the end of the episode, Krabs destroys the bulletin board and sweeps all the notes out of the Krusty Krab, sure. However, SpongeBob does say that it wasn't the board's fault, instead it was everyone else's. So I don't really see that as them taking the side of just like destroying the internet or doing some crazy mass censorship or something. Also, I think a bit of story and metaphor segregation have to happen there just because this bulletin board in the Krusty Krab was legitimately causing problems for Krabs' business. It's obvious that the people who made this episode understand internet culture at least a little bit. Because trust me, if they didn't, this would have been really cringy. And in fact, instead of being cringy, it's actually pretty funny. Lines like Squidward saying that he was working at the Krusty Krab ironically, and Mr. Krabs urging people to feed their hatred. And there's also not internet related humor, like how Mr. Krabs was ready to murder an old lady just so she'd write something nice in her will. It's dark, but it's brief, so it's funny. And then also how Spongebob's interpretation of Patrick's line is that baseball gloves remind him of his childhood, when in reality Patrick just likes the taste of baseball gloves. Honestly, if Spongebob wants to get a little topical and do it in a way that still makes sense within the show's universe and doesn't come off as preachy or weird, then I'm all for it. Kenny the Cat might have been a bit odd in this way, but bulletin board is spot on. I was very pleasantly shocked and amazed when I realized what this episode was actually about, and I do highly recommend it. Episode 202A, Food Con Castaways. SpongeBob, Patrick, Squidward, and Krabs get stranded in the wilderness. Because that's a completely original premise for this show. I know I'm gonna catch some flack for this, but I've gotta call it as I see it. Look, if you don't watch the show that much, maybe you haven't seen every episode, or maybe you've only ever seen every episode once, or something like that, then I could definitely see you enjoying this episode. But from where I stand, this episode adds nothing at all all new to the show. It's similar to Club Spongebob because the characters are in a kind of similar looking wilderness and Squidward, as well as other characters, are unable to eat despite the fact that there's food around because of Spongebob's own rules. It's like to save a squirrel because again, characters trapped in the wilderness desperate for food. But the most egregious of all of these is the fact that this episode follows the exact same format of a Squarepants family vacation from last season, right down to the fact that it starts with a road trip where Spongebob and Patrick are annoying the other passengers before it just suddenly randomly takes a left turn and the characters are stranded in the wilderness where they conveniently find their way out because their destination was like three feet away. Even some of the little details like the mention of music soothing the savage beast, I can see some jokes in here. I didn't really find any of them funny, and certainly not funny enough to excuse the fact that this episode has been done in a number of ways, and this one does nothing at all to vary it up. I really would have rathered the episode have been about this food convention. It's a scumbob episode. I definitely could see the argument for why this is a good or meh episode, but I'm just kind of sick of having them tell me this story again and again and again. If there was some new twist on it, really any at all, it would be a lot better. But no, it's just so samey and boring. Even the ending too. They go with the Spongebob in slow motion gag, which has been done on this show a number of times, most recently in Company Picnic, but dating back to usage and even pre-movie, and the ending where the guy eats the gross patty and of course just randomly and conveniently loves it and Krabs gets the award. It's predictable, it's cheesy, it's cliches that this show has done a number of times in the past, and I'm just not going to excuse it. What's the point of a show if they're going to 
keep telling me the same story again and again and again. I guess you could call it a very conventional episode. Oh, and there's a bumper sticker on the trailer that says I heart seaweed, except the word C is conspicuously small. So, yeah, it's a drug reference. At some point after this video is out, I am going to make a square theory on what I consider to be just a bad copying of previous episodes versus when an episode is similar but still good on its own merits. So, look out for that. Episode 202B, Snail Mail. SpongeBob must learn how to fly after a wacky mail misunderstanding. Once again, SpongeBob is not taking his own advice. You don't need a plane to fly. All you need is friendship. Although, maybe he is taking his own advice because he wanted to fly because of friendship. Jokes aside though, this is a particularly zany episode. And not just in the misunderstanding. The climax of the episode is just plain hijinks. It feels like an homage to all those classic black and white cartoons that would do this sort of story. Where the character is just flying in a plane, causing all manner of havoc. And it works. There isn't really much to talk about, it's just some zaniness. And while I don't think it's quite on par of the first three seasons zaniness, it is still fun to watch nonetheless. The story is good as well. It's definitely an interesting way to set up Spongebob flying in an airplane, but it definitely works, especially with the title being a pun. As far as jokes, well, there's not really anything I laughed at, but like I said, it's a pretty zany episode, so I at least smiled at a lot of the stuff, like Spongebob splitting the big plane in two and the passenger having to heave ho it back together, the tennis match being played on the plane, and of course the classic who's flying the plane. I was a little bit iffy on the underwear gag, but it did turn into a running gag that kinda gets funnier every time it's used. I think it's a good episode, though it's definitely closer to meh than it is very good. The misunderstanding is silly, but isn't anything particularly groan worthy, and all in all it's just a decently fun episode. And I do especially like the fact that they put Sandy in as well to teach Spongebob how to fly, instead of just having some random new character. Although, does Sandy know how to fly herself? I mean, she flies a helicopter sometimes times, and she is a woman of science, but like, does that just automatically make her an accomplished pilot as well? I mean, it seems like something Sandy would know, but I don't know, it's just a little weird. And speaking of her training, she trains Spongebob in a video game, and this is the third time this season that this has happened. Krabs used one to train Spongebob in Tudor Sauce, Spongebob trains his thumbs on one in Two Thumbs Down, and then we have this here. This definitely isn't a criticism, it's just me pointing out an unusual pattern in 9B. Episode 203A. Pineapple Invasion. Plankton searches Spongebob's house for the formula. There's so much about this episode that just makes sense, and I'm kind of amazed they didn't do these things earlier. The concept of Gary and Plankton having to fight against each other, and the concept of characters going inside of Gary's shell. It seems like they would have done these things years ago, but no. Plankton and Gary have interacted before, most notably in Shellback Shenanigans, but even in that episode, the actual interaction between the two is minimal. So once again, it's nice to see them using a pairing of characters that don't usually get put together. And Gary's shell being bigger on the inside is just kind of an obvious Spongebob thing, since everything is bigger on the inside in this universe. But beyond those concepts, Plankton gets a lot of lines here and spends a lot of the episode either by himself or with Gary. And it's usually pretty awesome to just see Plankton being Plankton. He has some great moments and one-liners here. Like how he says he doesn't like the taste of pineapple, and then he tastes some of Gary's litter and says it's still better than pineapple. Him wrecking Spongebob's house almost completely nonchalantly, and how he just gets completely wrecked in a fight against Gary. And those are just some of the Plankton jokes. There's also Mr. Krabs going on this really long-winded and elaborate speech about how dumb Plankton is, and Spongebob freaking out about these precious things in his house being wrecked, and also a glass of water because he was gonna drink that. I could easily see this standing along some of the good episodes from the first three seasons. Because, yeah, it's good. It's really good. And one of the cool little touches in this episode is that Plankton says what are probably considered to be the three most well-known catchphrases on the show. He copies Spongebob's I'm ready, gives his trademark I went to college, and in a really funny moment screams my leg. And that's why it's a little plankton leg down there. It's especially fitting because it's Doug Lawrence that typically voices the my leg fish. Oh and both the setup and ending of this story are great. I love all of the shenanigans with Mr. Krabs having to put on Spongebob's arm as a nose and searching for plankton in the big cloud of gross skunk smell. It definitely starts the episode off with a very memorable event. And then I love 
how it comes back in the end, where had Plankton been able to smell, he would have known that there are toxic fumes inside of Gary's shell. And the reveal of just how messed up he looks inside the shell is particularly funny, as well as the doctor's weird hatred of people who don't have noses. It's really funny, it's really memorable, it's a good story that even comes full circle, and it features everyone's favorite copepod. What more could you ask for in a Spongebob episode? Episode 203B, Salsa Imbasilicus. After Plankton's latest scheme turns everyone into idiots, Sandy and Karen must educate them. So, much like the last episode, this one features an unusual team-up, Karen and Sandy. And in general, I am all for getting both of those two characters in the spotlight more often. But this episode is... dumb. It's, it's awful, it really is. First off, a large chunk of it is spent with characters being dumb, and they go with the laziest way to portray a dumb person. They have them go duh, 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 and just walk into walls and stuff. They don't have clever jokes about this, it's just dumb people being dumb. In fact, they even made Patrick dumber in this episode. Patrick's usually pretty dumb, but he's usually not this brain dead. In fact, it's actually kind of unpleasant to see. It's not just that he's slow or misses the point or whatever. He is severely mentally disabled in this episode. Anyway, the point is, no, I was not amused by all the duh humor. Another problem with this episode is that it's all over the place. First, it's about this salsa. But no, the salsa is just an excuse so that they can get to the dumb people. But then Karen and Sandy focus on trying to make Plankton smart again. When that fails, then they set up their college thing and we get a montage of them educating everyone in Bikini Bottom. But then we suddenly shift and we see that Plankton is a bully that's trying to get the formula from Krabs, but despite graduating early, this is all a part of his acting class grade months later? It's like nobody actually thought this through. The concept of Plankton, Spongebob, and Krabs, and the other characters being in a college or a school setting is an interesting one, but they do not give that any time to play out. So much focus is given to the setup, the dumb humor, and then setting up this whole college thing that by the time we actually get to the struggle between Plankton and Krabs, it's just so brief that it's like, what's even the point? Seeing Plankton being dumb is one thing, but his whole shtick is that he's supposed to be a scientist and he went to college. Seeing him be anti-school here is just kind of against his character in general. I get that he was made stupid by the salsa, I'm just saying that it's just a weird writing choice to make him be the stupid character here. I mean, at least make fun of the fact that it's unusual for him. And Krabs, who's usually anti-school, he has a whole rant about how school is all a sham in Tudor sauce, apparently has this huge glowing opinion of it now. It's just a weird episode that doesn't know what it wants to be, and it completely squanders the potential for a Karen Sandy team up by inexplicably shifting back to crabs and plankton. And the mislead at the end just doesn't make any sense and feels really forced. Especially because there's no build up to it. It's just plankton trying to steal the recipe from crabs on graduation day, but lol, it was all just acting. And the formula was never actually in any danger. Oh, and I almost forgot about the butt licking scene. Yeah, there's this really gross part where Patrick licks plankton's really bulbous looking butt, and Plankton is very disturbed by this. I can definitely appreciate some clever toilet humor, but this was not that. This was just disgusting. It's obviously a Stumbob episode. Really, everything about it is just dumb. The humor's infantile, and the focus is scattershot. There's some good ideas in here, but the execution is just imbecilicus. 204A, Mutiny on the Krusty. The Krusty Krab is relocated by a rip current. So I'm kind of conflicted on this episode. Because the Krusty Krab being turned into a ship and getting stuck in a rip current is a cool idea, and I do like the sequences of SpongeBob steering the Krusty Krab and some other stuff associated with that part of the premise. But then you have the other part of the premise, which is Mr. Krabs being a horrible tyrant, which I do not think works. Here's the thing. When you want to portray a character who is an insufferable jerk, like Mr. Krabs here, or, I don't know, Dr. House on House MD, you have to give them a redeeming quality for why them being a jerk is tolerated. Typically, this is done by making them competent at what they do. And sure, in this episode, Mr. Krabs does beat up the monster and save the day. However, consider this. It's Krabs' fault they're all in this situation in the first place. 
He locks them in the Krusty Krab, forces them to spend their money, and tells them that there is absolutely nothing to worry about because of his little knee barometer thing, which turns out to be completely wrong. It's not like Krabs is a tyrant, but oh man, he gets stuff done. No, he's the tyrant that got you into this situation. Just because he was able to get you out of it doesn't make him any less of an obnoxious, insufferable, awful person. He's not a good captain. He's not a good anything. He's just mean for the sake of being mean here. And that's a apparently something to be celebrated? There are other ways they could have fixed this as well. Maybe have Krabs explain to Spongebob that sometimes a leader does need to get tough or else stuff won't actually get done. Or maybe have the Bikini Bottomites treat Krabs like dirt in the first place, which leads to him being a tyrant later on. The other way that this sort of story could have worked would be to have Krabs be a tyrant at the beginning and then have him redeem himself at the end. But the way it plays out is that he makes everyone beg him for forgiveness. And even even then he's still not motivated to save the day. Ugh, he's just so unlikable here. And for once, that's actually the point of the episode. It's not one of those things where they accidentally made him jerky like what happens with Patrick a lot of the time. No, the story is just that he is a miserable, horrible captain. In fact, if anything, SpongeBob is most certainly the hero. And while thankfully he does get rewarded in the end, the reward is his paycheck, and he doesn't get nearly enough credit that he deserves for steering the ship, trying to keep everyone together, volunteering to go fight the monster, and being the one who is able to motivate Krabs to fight said monster. But at the same time, there are things to like in the episode, like SpongeBob's face and line about how he'll spend Krabs' His dime is very, very just one bite esque. Speaking of that dime, why is it like a normal coin? Why isn't it that giant rock thing that he had in Can You Spare a Dime? Not only have they been actually doing a lot of continuity nods this season, it just seems to be an arbitrary contradiction. They could have told this exact same story with Mr. Krabs' first nickel or something. It's not a huge deal, but it's distracting and really didn't have to be like this. So, does my frustration with Krabs' character here basically override any of the little enjoyable things I found in this episode, or do those things balance this out to a meh? Unfortunately, Krabs' behavior does drive it into scumbob territory. It is a huge damper on what is otherwise a pretty decent episode. I usually don't mind episodes where Krabs is the antagonist, but the problem here is that the show treats him like he's done a good thing in the end. I'm sure it's supposed to be for comedy reasons or something, but it all just comes off as really unpleasant. Also, did you know that Mr. Krabs created an edible hat called the Hattie Patty? Hey, I've been working on these videos for a long time. Not every single fact can be fun. Tooth 04B, the whole tooth. Patrick is afraid of losing his baby tooth. This is actually a really cute episode. I like what they did with Patrick's character this season. They have greatly minimized his jerky tendencies and played up the more childlike side. And that's how Patrick acts here. He's just a little kid who doesn't want to lose his tooth because he's afraid of a little change. And it's really nice seeing SpongeBob trying to help him through this rough time. I really like the scene with SpongeBob as the warden with the worms because it's all in Patrick's imagination. Again, Patrick is a stand-in for a child in this episode, so it makes sense why he'd over-exaggerate Spongebob trying to help into him being this bad guy that's out to hurt Patrick's tooth. Also, Patrick drinking the water and becoming the pond is a pretty funny gag. And in general, it is a pretty funny episode. The dentist using this horrible implement to open up a drawer with a much more tame clamp to take Patrick's tooth out. The radio broadcasting dramatic stings. The horrific teeth on the magazine and the old lady. And the story is nice as well. It's just your simple losing your tooth story. Many cartoons have tackled this before, but I think that Spongebob's take here is a very pleasant one, and one that might actually help a few kids be more okay with losing their teeth. And I especially like the ending twist. I did not see that coming. It actually managed to be clever and unpredictable, using a play on words that I've personally never seen before. It's a good story that I'm sure is relatable to some, with very likable characters, some good comedy, and a pretty surprising ending twist. Of course, it's a good episode, and there's nice little details too, like the fact that Patrick once again hates doctors, and that the dentist's name is Beige Mundane, which is of course a nice way to show kids that dentists aren't scary in the slightest. Although, what was up with that empty fish bowl in the dentist's office? Yeah, I know a lot of dentists have fish, but the characters are fish, so it just raises so many questions as to what the purpose of that fish tank is. And that is every episode of Spongebob 9B, and also season 9 as a whole, 
reviewed. I have exactly three notes that fit more for 9B than 9 as a whole. Firstly is the good atmosphere. I don't think I really need to elaborate on this because I've said it a few times in this video, but yeah, 9B really gets that atmosphere right. The only other season that really strikes me as having this kind of really good atmosphere would be season 1. So when people say that season 9, especially 9B, is a return to form for Spongebob, well, I can agree with that sentiment on at least this aspect. Secondly, Patrick is incredibly likable in 9B. Not only did they greatly downplay his jerkishness, but they also played up the more lovable aspects of his character. Even in one of his more harsh appearances in 9B, The Fishbowl, he's still not nearly as bad as he was in the previous seasons. Let's not forget that Patrick is the reason why a lot of episodes got scumbobs. Even in 9A, we still had episodes like Little Yellow Book that really played up his more obnoxious characteristics. But I feel like there was some sort of conscious effort on the part of the writing team to make sure Patrick was more likable in 9B. And I hope it sticks because it is really nice being able to just like Patrick again and not have to ask myself at the beginning of the episode, oh, is it going to be one of these Patrick appearances? And lastly, the comedy is a lot better in 9B than it was in 9A. And in 8 as well. And 7 and six. Really, 9B is the funniest crop of Spongebob episodes since about season four or five. It still doesn't rival the first three seasons, but the comedy here is still good. So now let's go to the charts. 9B has 17 good episodes, five meh episodes, and seven scumbobs. Comparing that to 9A, you'll see that there's a lot more good episodes and a lot less meh and a little less scumbob. So where does that put the rating for 9B? Well, after much deliberation, I have to say that the second half of season Season 9 is a good half season. Wow, they actually did it. They delivered a chunk of content that I could consider as a whole to be good. I don't know that I ever thought I'd see the day. And while technically this is only half the season and we still have to get to the rating for 9 as a whole, I think that this is still a very, very good thing. Is 9B as good as the first three seasons? No, and it's still not really that close. But that is perfectly okay. I would never really expect Spongebob to be able to reach what it did in the first three seasons, nor would I ever expect it to be able to just go back to that time and have that exact same style of humor and storytelling. A lot of time has passed, a lot of writers have come and gone, and unfortunately that's just never going to be the case. But that doesn't mean that the show can't still be good in a new way. And the fact that the show isn't quite as good as a really, really, really good run of episodes should not diminish from the fact that this is absolutely something to be celebrated. All right, on to season nine as a whole. Looking at this chart, it is eerily similar percentage-wise to season four. And I think that's about right. Considering 9A was meh and 9B was good, but certainly not amazing, it does feel right to place it in the upper meh category. But it is definitely better than season 8, and I think it is a worthy rival of seasons 4 and 5. And if that's the quality that the show is going to be at from here on out, then I think that's okay. And having almost half the episodes be good is a really good thing. All right, now onto my notes for season 9 as a whole. First of of all, there's no Flying Dutchman, which struck me as a bit weird because there's been a token Flying Dutchman appearance in every single season. And heck, there's even a ghost episode in season 9, but the Flying Dutchman is mysteriously absent. I don't know, maybe they couldn't get the voice actor or something? Also, there's new background fish. They've been pretty much relying on the same background fish models for well over a decade now. It's nice to see some newer models get mixed in with the older ones. Oh, and speaking of the background fish, there's actually a running gag in this season. Old Man Jenkins, that is the the version of Old Man Jenkins that is short, round, and wears glasses, I don't know, maybe he's not even Old Man Jenkins anymore at this point, is repeatedly seen in unfortunate situations this season. In Little Yellow Book, he fell in the toilet. In Spongebob, you're fired. He's floating on Spongebob's tears and can't pay for the toilet price at the end. In the sewers of Bikini Bottom, he also almost gets flushed. And those aren't even the only examples. I think it's kind of funny to have him be this butt monkey background character that finds himself in all of these weird situations that also frequently involve the bathroom. It's just another thing that makes this season feel really unique. Although if they continued it onwards, I definitely wouldn't complain. There's many continuity nods in season 9. The TV show Patrick was watching in Squid Baby, the picture gag in Mrs. Puff's house, the My Leg gag being referenced, among others, with an extra special mention to Mall Girl Pearl. It's nice that they were able to throw in these little Easter eggs that only longtime fans would really pick up on. And after Bubble Buddy returns, I'm kind of glad they went to really small, subtle references instead of being big and obvious with it. And last 
lastly, there is a bigger focus this season on the other characters. What do I mean by other characters? I mean characters that aren't Spongebob. Patrick gets a great deal of focus in Patrick Man, Patrick the Game, Executive Treatment, and What's Eating Patrick. Plankton gets focus in episodes like Jailbreak, Plankton's Pet, Copy Bob Ditto Pants, and Pineapple Invasion. Krabs gets Safe Deposit Krabs, Pull Up a Barrel, What's Eating Patrick, and Married to Money. Squidward gets Little Yellow Book, Squid Defense, and Squid Plus One. And Sandy gets The Fish Bowl, Sandy's Nutmare, and Salsa in Basilicus. Kind of. And of course, there's Larry's Jim and Mall Girl Pearl. And while the show has always had some episodes that are from other characters' perspectives, mainly Plankton, Squidward, and Krabs, I think this season went above and beyond in sharing the protagonist's role and focus with a lot of the secondary and even tertiary cast, which is a great way to add variety to the series and is a good way to tell different stories that you couldn't tell with Spongebob. It's really saying something when four out of the five good episodes in 9A are Plankton episodes. And of these, none of them are traditional Steal the Formula episodes. Eakin Urchin involves him helping Krabs. Jailbreak is a lot more focused on the jailbreak itself. It came from Goo Lagoon has Plankton utilizing a weapon more so than outright trying to steal the formula or trick it out of the characters. And Plankton's pet has almost nothing to do with the formula. It makes me so happy to see that the writers definitely want to mix things up with Plankton and don't want to just rehash the same story ideas again and again. Sure, we did have cliche evil spatula, but four out of five of his major appearances shaking up the formula, no pun intended, is a very good thing. And now, get ready for a pretty lengthy bottom five. Actually, before I get to the five themselves, I have to give an honorary number six slot to an episode. This was an episode that I think was close to being number five, but only just barely got beat out by the actual number five. This episode is Company Picnic. In my review, I spoke at length about how I thought Plankton's plan was just incredibly stupid from a number of different angles, and the conflict in this episode was really flimsy and just kind of insulting to the audience. And that is true. But this didn't get on the bottom five because the number five choice left me just a bit more irritated than this one. And on the positive side of things, I do have to say that Company Picnic looks really good visually. Number five. Little Yellow Book. So the reason why this episode is so low on the list is that I do think the first half of the episode is actually pretty good. It's really not a bad setup for an episode with Squidward finding Spongebob's diary. And there's some good comedy in here, like Spongebob finding Old Man Jenkins in the toilet, and the customers being ravenous. And I like Squidward reading about Spongebob's recounting of Squidward cursing at him and Gary biting him in return. It's actually a really clever bit to hear Spongebob narrating the situation without hearing either character talk. These parts of the episode kept it lower on the bottom five list, but man oh man, did Jerky Patrick have to get one last dig in before they got rid of him in 9b. He is very unpleasant here, and so is Squidward. The second half of the episode has the story go exactly nowhere, and the ending just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Spongebob is crying, and Squidward hasn't learned a thing. Squidward's been a jerk in plenty of episodes, but usually they give him at least a shred of human decency by having him learn his lesson at the end, and in other episodes what Squidward does to Spongebob actually isn't all that bad and doesn't go much beyond just being generally rude and negative towards Spongebob. There's parts of this episode that I like, and then there's the rest of it. Number 4. Married to Money. The thing about this episode is that much like the rest of 9b, it does have a good atmosphere. By which I mean it has some very pleasant music, it features a wedding, and so it's a happy celebration and ceremony, etc, etc. The episode just kind of feels nice. But the problem is that it isn't. The story is flimsy, boring, predictable, and has a very unsatisfying ending all around. The fact that the tone makes it seem nicer than it is actually makes it a lot worse. It's not a Sharks vs. Pod situation where the atmosphere is able to make up for the light story. Here, there's just so many things that are unsatisfying about this story. And really, the ending especially is what kills me here. Endings are very important. It's the last thing you leave the audience with. And while SpongeBob usually does have dumb gag endings at the very end, typically they at least wrap up the story before they do their stupid ending. Like in the fishbowl. Yes, they have that dumb gag at the very end where it turns out that they're really studying Squidward, but even before that, they do have an actual ending to the story. In this one, the ending is is Plankton is revealed and then Krabs is gonna be alone, I guess. 
Adding the usual stupid gag in the form of having to tip the bellboy waiter guy is even worse than usual because there's no substance that even comes before it. In terms of positives, I can still say that I did like everything involving Pearl in the episode, and the episode's problem is more of a lack of substance than the presence of things that I really don't like, which is why I think it's better than the rest of the episodes on this list. Number three. Salsa in Basilicus. The comedy in this episode is dumb jokes. That's pretty much the bulk of what it has to offer you. The frustrating thing is that this stupid scene happens smack dab in the middle of the episode as well. It's not at the very beginning where you could forget it happened and enjoy the rest of the episode. It's not at the very end where you can at least enjoy the first part of the episode. No, it's right in the middle, bridging together the first part, which is Plankton's plan, and the second part, which is this weird college story. It's just this like two minute long void where nothing happens in the story, and it's just a bunch of dumb jokes. Any momentum and intrigue that was building with Plankton's original plan at the start is just immediately killed right here. And then, because this goes on so long and this comes before it, the whole college plot just doesn't have any time. I cannot get emotionally invested in what's going on because we're just so suddenly thrown right into this conflict of Plankton being a bully and Krabs reinventing the Krabby Patty formula. And of course, all of the stupid jokes and this weird other plot of Krabs and Plankton takes away from what should have been the focus of the episode, Karen and Sandy. I like the fact that not only does the episode pair them together, but it does put them in a scenario in which it makes sense for them to bond over. Seeing as Sandy's a scientist and Karen's a computer, they're both some of the smartest people in town. But what a wasted potential it is. This is also one of those episodes that kind of gets worse the more you watch it, as the dumb jokes weren't funny the first time, but by god are they definitely not funny the second or third times. Number two, Squid Baby. This episode basically plays out like a better version of a season six episode. What I mean by this is that that season was known for a lot of these quote unquote squid torture episodes where Squidward gets beaten up a lot and generally doesn't do too much wrong to even deserve it. But the thing is, they actually do a decent job averting a lot of the problems that those episodes run into. Patrick gets called out by SpongeBob when he hurts Squidward's head on the ceiling. Patrick also does a pretty daring rescue to help Squidward and only lands the road on his head because he was desperately trying to save him and not out of just being stupid and inconsiderate. And in general, the two of them do care about Squidward's well-being and really are trying their best to nurse him back to health. But even still, the episode does follow a similar structure to the ones that they've done a number of times in the past, and everyone kind of got sick of years ago when they overused it. It also has that really cringy stuff with Spongebob and Patrick acting like genuine babies at the start of it, the general uncomfortableness of the fact that Squidward is turned into a baby and at the end has a poopy diaper, which is pretty gross, and the episode's really not funny. And here's the thing, even if you strip away the other bad elements, like you're fine with the bad stuff that happens to Squidward because Spongebob and Patrick are trying their best. Or maybe you're not as weirded out by some of the adult baby poopy diaper stuff as I am. At the end of the day, the episode is just a rehash of Rockabye Bivalve and to an extent Goo Goo Gas. In fact, the first half of the episode pretty much is Rockabye Bivalve and the second half of the episode is similar to Goo Goo Gas. So on top of a number of already uncomfortable, bad, and not funny things, it's it's just not original. Despite the fact that it's number two, and I am saying that it's pretty bad, I don't actually think it's completely, entirely, miserably awful. The fact that the number two worst episode in this season is one that I don't think is quite as bad as pretty much any of the other bottom fives from season five onwards is a very good thing. Even some of the worst of this season still has some redeeming qualities. I mean, even season eight that was generally towards the middle still had at least a handful of episodes that were pretty dang bad scumbobs. But this one, it's bad. Oh yeah, it is bad. But it's not that bad. But you know what is that bad? My number one. This should surprise exactly no one, but it is Spongebob, you're fired. Honestly, I think that this episode is almost up there with Truth or Square in terms of wasting the audience's time and not having a clue exactly what it wants to do with its story. There's something wrong with pretty much every section of the episode. The part with Spongebob actually being fired is over such a stupidly trivial thing and him crying and crying and crying goes on and on. The part with him moping around the house is so dry and 
boring. Him and Patrick being fun employed is also really slow and boring and is just a slog to get through. Then the whole section with Spongebob trying to get a new job, making only Krabby Patties, getting kicked out, and then later getting kidnapped by each and every one of these food places is just just badly written. It's repetitive and completely illogical. Why is every single one of these places trying to kidnap him? He wanted to work for them. The scene with him preparing food for Gary is irrelevant. It does nothing for the story. And it's not funny. It literally just feels like a scene in there to fill time. And then the ending is 186% predictable. Do you think maybe you could come up with something a little more creative than the Krusty Krab went to Krusty Crap when SpongeBob wasn't around to keep everything together? This episode is way worse than than Squid Baby and way worse than anything else season 9 has to offer. I think it is one of the most obnoxious specials and I can't even see the potential for a good episode in here. Because even the base idea of Spongebob being fired as an episode has already kind of been done in a number of different ways. Spongebob had to take a mandatory vacation in Bummer Vacation, he has been fired before in Karate Choppers, he thought he was fired in Model Sponge, and he's even tried to leave of his own volition in As Seen on TV. Not to mention, the time that he and Squid went on strike. Or the time he was forced to work at the Chum Bucket. And these are just the times I remember off the top of my head. Point is, save for a very brief fight scene, I can't find anything redeemable about this episode. The writers say that Nickelodeon wasn't involved in this episode outside of just renaming the title, but if that's the case, then I just simply don't understand how something this bad could come from a season that in general is way better than this. And that's my bottom five. Or technically six, I guess. As for the episodes that didn't make it on the list, in general, they do all have at least one or two things that redeems them a little bit. Or their bad elements aren't that bad compared to some of the worst from other seasons. Patrick Mann does have that great climax. Squid Defense is a predictable kind of boring episode that almost got a meh. Safe Deposit Crabs might be boring and neandering, but it doesn't leave me that bored or that frustrated with it. And I feel the same way about Sanctuary. I did like like some parts of Mutiny on the Krusty, Foodcon Castaways is mostly bad for the repeated plot, and had that not been a problem, the episode would have been at least a meh, and the fishbowl does have some psychology in it which I do like. And that covers every scumbob in the season. And now, for the top 5 episodes of season 9. Number 5, Mall Girl Pearl. This episode is number five because it is 100% a breath of fresh air in a show that has been going on for over 200 episodes. There was a very conscious effort here to make this episode different. New setting, different protagonist, and a larger focus on background continuity jokes. And while yes, Larry's Gym did do something similar, I think Mall Girl Pearl beats it out because it doesn't need to rely on Spongebob at all all to carry the story. And make no mistake, I'm not saying it's good just because it's different. It's the fact that it's different, but also enjoyable. Betty White makes a wonderful guest star, and the story, though not incredibly crazy or anything, is still very satisfying to watch. Pearl is likable and you understand her motivations, the friendship seems genuine and sweet, and there are some really solid gags in here, not even counting the ones that are just in the background. It's episodes like this that help the show from falling into mediocrity again. Number four, bulletin board. Now you might have expected that this episode was going to land higher on the top five. And honestly, before really thinking about it, I kind of thought it would too. After all, the metaphor for this episode being about the internet is amazingly clever. And there's some really funny gags in there related to it. But the reason why this is lower on the list is just the fact that the literal story does kind of suffer a little bit. Like when you get right down to it, the middle of the episode is just a lot of characters reacting to things that have been written on the board. Not much story progress is happening. And then when we finally get to the climax and Crab, SpongeBob, and Squidward stake out to see who is the one posting all of these messages, they find out it's Patrick and then Mr. Krabs destroys the board and they all go knitting. I mean, I'm not saying I wanted them to beat up Patrick or anything because he did seem to have a good heart in all of this, but from a story perspective, it is a little bit of an anti climax. Like the episode should have been building to something greater or more interesting. I don't know, maybe Krabs destroying the bulletin board in plain sight and all of the other customers trying desperately to save their notes or something? Or perhaps some sort of scene where Patrick is desperately trying to disguise who he is while hiding behind a bunch of notes, maybe? I don't know exactly what could have been done, but I do think that the literal story of the episode could be made to be a little bit more interesting. Not that it's bad, it just doesn't have a lot going on. And if you're thinking, 
wow, he's being really negative on an episode that he put as the fourth best episode of the season, just remember that I do still think very highly of it, and the only reason why I'm not gushing about it is because, well, I already did that in the actual review. Number three, Sandy's Nutmare. This is just an all-around good episode. I wouldn't say that it really amazingly excels at any one or two aspects, but rather that every aspect of the episode is just really good. Good guest star, funny jokes, good moral, a sequence with a unique art style. It's Sandy-focused, a character who doesn't get that much attention compared to other main characters. I even like the fact that it's about Sandy's tree, which is something that's in most of the episodes that she is in, but doesn't really get to do much or Ordinarily. This episode is the opposite of a nightmare. In fact, it's not a nightmare. It's a nutmare. Ooh, that one was bad. Number two, Pineapple Invasion. Okay, so the reason this beats out almost every other episode in the season is just that I think that this episode is really, really funny. Funnier than most post-movie episodes. I truly cannot overstate how funny I think this episode is. And beyond that, it features a memorable opening set piece and a great team-up. Or rivalry, I guess, in this case. And my number one favorite episode of SpongeBob Season 9 is Plankton's Pet. Yeah, the best two episodes of Season 9, in my opinion, both involve Plankton and a pet. Huh. Anyway, do I really need to say how great this episode is? I'm sure you've all heard it by now. It's an episode so good that it would fit in not just with the first three seasons, but with some of the best episodes from the first three seasons. Plankton is almost always a fun character. It's a story archetype that has proven to work very well. There's a lot of great dark humor and other jokes about Spot being really small. And there's a fun climax with some good twists that are loosely based in real life science. Also, something that doesn't get pointed out too much is the fact that SpongeBob and Plankton actually bond pretty nicely in the episode. Plankton actually thanks SpongeBob for helping him look for Spot. It really shows how dynamic of a character Plankton is. So yeah, put this one up there as another one of my favorites from the post-movie era. Right up there with No Hat for Pat and It's a Spongebob Christmas. And that's season 9 for you. I can't really believe that we've finally reached this point. It's been a long time coming and season 9 was instrumental in me deciding to make this series in the first place. It's been a pretty crazy ride and I'm definitely not stopping here. But I think at this point I've definitely proven that not all modern Spongebob is bad. And even in some of the worst seasons there are still some hidden gems, and some mediocre seasons that still have a significant amount of good episodes. Because of the nature of the show, one episode could be absolutely abominably miserable where you hate all the characters and everything that goes on in the story, and the one right before it can be an amazing, beautiful piece of art that's funny, witty, and meaningful. Though I've certainly gleaned some patterns from reviewing the series one season at a time, really each episode should be taken and judged individually, and sweeping generalizations certainly don't give you the whole picture. So as always, Always, thank you to Encyclopedia Spongebobia, Spongebody Mania, Andrew for the awesome Tomfoolery remix, and Incomptech for the rest of the music, and my artist Aaron. And a super thanks to all my patrons out there. Thank you guys so very much. With an extra special thanks to Sukanzu, the DS guy, Vidja Bros, Mabe's Voice, as well as those who have donated large sums in the past, Bash Fluff, Halston Blaine W, and Mr. Tortellini 00. And I need to announce that my Patreon is no longer going to be used. I am very appreciative of everyone who's helped me out over the years, but it's not a service I wish to continue using. Well, I'm off to have a lonely, convenient dinner for one. See you guys in season 10. Hi, guy rules out.